Well, well, CW, we meet again, you punk. This has been a long time coming. We all knew it was gonna happen, and it's about time because I got shit to say. It took me time, eight months to be exact, and I'm a little late, but who cares? Today, we are gonna talk about a show that completely took the world by storm, a true icon of the 2010s. See, I think when it comes to teen television, it's hard to find phenomenons that were as strong as the Vampire Diaries. Not that there weren't any, but when we talk about iconic teen dramas, especially in the supernatural realm, chances are it's gonna be the first one to come up. And for good reason. The Vampire Diaries came out at the perfect time. The pilot aired on the CW on September 10, 2009, just 10 months after the release of the first Twilight film. It was brilliant timing. The Twilight craze was in full effect, but fans had to wait for the next movies to come out, which usually took a couple years, and The Vampire Diaries became the promise of satisfying that craving on a weekly basis. It was bound to be a hit. The timing was too good. And it was a hit. While it was airing, The Vampire Diaries was the biggest show the CW had ever produced at the time. Bigger than the likes of Smallville, Supernatural, or even Gossip Girl. And it was an absolute pop culture monument almost instantly. The fan base grew so fast and became so big it was impossible not to see it. This show was everywhere. And I know a lot of you guys are already salivating at the idea idea of me coming on here and dropping a diss track on TVD and all of its insane antics for two hours straight, but guys, I have a secret. I actually used to like this show. Like... A lot. I think I'm one of those people that fell into the Vampire Diaries wave at the perfect moment. This show premiered four days before my 15th birthday, and it perfectly matched the angsty vibes of the moody teenager I was back then. I looked like this, by the way, let's not talk about it. I loved the Vampire Diaries as a teenager, and to be fair, despite being worthy of a lot of criticism, I still firmly believe the show has its merits, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But it's also a show that is notorious for its flaws. And I think it is no secret that The Vampire Diaries is a little bit of a mess. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's scale back for a minute. So. For the uninitiated, The Vampire Diaries is the story of Elena Gilbert, a teenage girl from a small town of Mystic Falls in the state of Virginia. When we meet her, Elena is depressed and feeling a bit lost a few months after the tragic death of her parents in a car accident. She's slowly trying to pick herself up after her loss, and we follow her as she attempts to take care of herself and her little brother at the start of a new school year. She's 100% determined to get a sense of normalcy back in her daily routine, but Elena's life takes a drastic turn when, on the first day of school, she crosses paths with Stefan Salvatore, a mysterious new student with a lot of secrets. I'm Elena. I'm Stefan. I know. We have history together. As she learns to know Stefan and gets attached to him, she begins to uncover the truth behind his enigmatic persona and is confronted to a terrifying reality. Stefan is a vampire. Before she knows it, Elena is thrown in a world of mythical creatures and supernatural shenanigans that reveal the true nature of this town she thought she knew her entire life. And it is only made even more horrific when Damon Salvatore, Stefan's older brother, arrives in town and goes on a violent killing spree. The premise is just kind of alright, but I gotta say, part of me was really excited to rewatch this show. I didn't remember a lot from the early seasons, I had only watched them once as a teenager. So the issue is that my most vivid memories of the Vampire Diaries are memories of the later seasons, which does not work in the show's favor because... These seasons are really bad. See, The Vampire Diaries had for showrunner a now notoriously disliked figure in teen television, Julie Plyke. That's her. Julie Plyke developed The Vampire Diaries with her buddy Kevin Williamson, who is mostly known for creating Dawson's Creek as well as for being the writer of iconic movies like Scream or I Know What You Did Last Summer. 
Yeah, just that. Together, they decided to adapt the Vampire Diaries series of novels written by L.J. Smith. And no, I can already see you screaming about Twilight ripoffs, but believe it or not, the Vampire Diaries novels were here first. They came out in the 90s. There's a whole drama about L.J. Smith not actually owning the rights to the novels, a whole thing about the company that hired her to write the novels. But that's a whole other can of worms I don't want to get into. But I highly recommend watching Jenny Nicholson's video about the Vampire Diaries if you haven't already. She he breaks it down extremely well. Anyways, Julie and Kevin worked their asses off to get the show off the ground, and eventually, a pilot was picked up by the CW. And like I said earlier, on September 10, 2009, The Vampire Diaries finally hit the screens. Hello, brother. And to say it was a strong run would be an understatement. Eight seasons, 171 episodes, two spin-off shows, 39 awards, and even a canon DC comic series. Like, this show really took a generation of teenagers by storm. It was a big deal. And it's not difficult to understand why. Let's dive into the show, shall we? Ooh, you're coming get it, uh, too far, yeah, but I scan it. Weak boys will get offended hey, you're staring blankly You don't look so happy Crow's a bit much, don't you think? Where do you see what I can do with the fog? Season 1 of The Vampire Diaries was just a winning formula for this type of show. And it was a really distinct type of experience to watch it again, because there was just so much I didn't remember about it. For one, I had completely forgotten how violent this show was for no reason, especially for a CW show. The early episodes all start with a horror sequence where people are murdered by Damon, who acts more like a slasher villain early on, and it's surprisingly really fun. I was surprised to be reminded that some of those scenes are actually kind of hardcore. They have no right to be as insanely violent as they are. Literally. Episode 2 starts with a couple camping in the woods, and the woman is alone inside of the tent, and she hears rain. She gets bummed, then goes outside and realizes it's actually the blood of her lover raining down on the tent as he hangs from a tree. That's so fucking metal, for no reason. Especially because right after that scene, the show just casually goes back to cute and cheesy romance, and it's such a weird contrast from the horror. The tone of the Vampire Diaries is all over the place, and just in general, I had forgotten how much horror there was in these early episodes. No joke, every single time Damon appears in a scene in the first like three episodes, his arrival is a jump scare. But anyway, season 1 does a solid job at introducing you to everything happening here. This show has a lot of characters, a little too many of them if you ask me, but it establishes every single one of them fairly well. Elena is trying her best to get over her parents' death, she's far from there, but she has hope that things will get better. We also find out towards the end of the pilot that Elena was actually in the car with her parents when the crash happened, but she survived and they didn't. So she's not only grieving her parents, she's also riddled with survivor's guilt, and she doesn't understand why she's still alive. And none of that is helped by the confusion her family members are feeling. Her little brother Jeremy is also struggling to grieve and has turned to drugs in an attempt to cope with his pain. Their aunt Jenna has become their legal guardian, but she's very young. If I remember well, she's in her late 20s, and she feels completely in over her head when it comes to being responsible for the lives of two teenagers. We're also introduced to Bonnie, Elena's best friend, who gets caught up in her own can of worms when she starts having strange visions and discovers she can do things nobody should be able to do. We'll talk more about Bonnie later, because I got a lot of thoughts. Later, we also get to meet Caroline, the obnoxious, popular girl from school who seems to think she's really close to Elena and Bonnie, but it's obvious to everyone that her friendship with them is very one-sided. And then, we get to meet Stefan, the mysterious, broody-type guy who is clearly hiding something. Hold up. Who's this? All I see is back. 
It's a hot bag. What the fu- Who says that? We quickly find out he's a vampire, but he refuses to kill people and he refuses to feed on human blood. So instead, he feeds on animal blood. He's back in Mystic Falls after several decades away, and while we don't exactly know why yet, we know it has something to do with Elena. It's not the most intriguing setup in the world, but it does the job. The characters, for the most part, all start the show in an acceptable way. It's funny to look at them and try to perceive them as teenagers. They all look way too old. Like, look at Matt Donovan. Look at him. This show asks you to believe that this guy is 17 years old. Stefan is also supposed to be 17, but Paul Wesley, who plays Stefan, was already 26 or 27 years old when he picked up the role. Elena is 17 as well, and her aunt Jenna is around 29 or 30 years old, but in real life, Nina Dobrev, who plays Elena, is only about a year and a half younger than Sarah Canning, who plays Aunt Jenna. The age and appropriate casting here is an absolute shit show. It's ridiculous and I'll never understand why American TV does that. Also, the dialogue is just so funny to me. The type of dialogue in The Vampire Diaries is one that is only common to American television, and I like to call that type of dialogue the Hollywood dialect. The way these people talk makes it impossible to believe them as characters because not a single person on this planet actually talks like that. It's this unnatural, heavily censored and contrived way of speaking that just doesn't seem normal. Stop, all right? You need to chill yourself, all right? <laughs> I've talked about this before, but I honestly don't understand why Americans are so conservative when it comes to swearing on television, because it makes absolutely no sense. Look at the show we're watching. Like I said earlier, The Vampire Diaries is an insanely violent show. We watch people get beheaded, hearts getting ripped out of chests, you watch corpses in the weirdest dispositions ever. There's so much blood in this show, and some seriously fucked up imagery in a program aimed at teenagers. And apparently, that's totally fine, but the characters can't say fuck because somehow, that's going too far. Explain to me how that makes sense, Captain. Anyways, aside from all that, the characters are all right. I do like the way they're introduced for the most part, and I like how everyone seems to have a distinct storyline from the jump. I also really like Damon in this season. I kind of forgot he was the first real villain of the show, and I gotta admit, it works extremely well. Like, he's actually an excellent villain. The Stefan versus Damon dynamic is really compelling, slowly unfolding their history and how these two brothers have come to hate each other this much is really compelling. And knowing this whole time that Damon is back in Mystic Falls for a reason, that he has a plan but we don't immediately know what he's trying to do, is really effective as a point of entry. I like that it's established from the get-go that Stefan cannot defeat Damon by just fighting him, because Stefan doesn't drink human blood, which makes him significantly weaker than Damon. The show lets you know almost immediately, if it comes down to a physical fight between the brothers, Stefan will lose every single time, there is no question there. So instead, the tension lies in Stefan having to outsmart Damon and essentially beat him at his own game, which is interesting because this mental battle shows that Damon is not only a brutally vicious and cruel antagonist, but he also reveals himself to be incredibly intelligent and calculated. He's always one step ahead, and even if you manage to one-up him, he'll balance the scale almost immediately with a trail of blood. No! Anyone, anytime, any place. I like how everybody essentially spends the season trying to make sure Damon doesn't get upset because he's so incredibly dangerous and unpredictable that doing anything that tickles his nerves could lead to the death of dozens of people. I also loved finding out that his big evil plan is actually not really evil. He's just trying to save the woman he loves. In a way, Damon is the hero of his own story. Which leads us to discovering that 145 years ago, Damon and Stefan were caught in a love triangle with a woman named Cat who was a vampire, and she also happens to look exactly like Elena. How is it possible? We don't know. Why is Elena an exact replica of Catherine? Total mystery. But we find out that back in 1864, a witch buried Catherine and other vampires in a tomb located under a church in Mystic Falls. And Damon has spent over a hundred years trying to find a way to get Catherine out of there. I like that a lot, actually. I like that Damon isn't just a mustache twirling 
villain who is evil just for the sake of it in this season. He actually has solid motivations that kind of humanize him. I have a bigger surprise, Stefan. I'm gonna bring her back. The whole vampire lore of the show can be a bit cringe at times, but some of it is interesting. I like the way humans get turned into vampires. There's a whole process to it. It's not just a single bite and boom, you're a vampire too. It's actually really different. To become a vampire, you first need to drink the blood of a vampire. Once that's done, once you have vampire blood in your system, you have to die. It doesn't matter how, you just need to be dead. The vampire blood will then take over and bring you back to life, but but only sort of. Once you wake up, you're in a state of transition. To complete the transition and finally become a vampire, you have to drink human blood within 24 hours. And if you don't drink human blood within 24 hours, you'll just die again and this time you'll be dead for good. I like that, I don't know why, but it adds a lot of narrative tension when certain people get turned. On the other side of it though, I think the idea of having vampires wear magic rings to be able to walk outside during the day is incredibly stupid. Same goes for humans wearing magic rings that bring them back to life if they die due to supernatural reasons. The whole magic ring thing on this show is so fucking dumb. That said, on paper, season 1 is a solid introduction to this universe. It's not perfect in any way, it is incredibly flawed, but I'd say that overall, season 1 is a fairly well balanced season with some interesting storylines to follow and some really bad storylines that could have been avoided. The storyline of Vicky Donovan becoming a vampire slowly down the pacing of the season a bit, but it still has a fairly effective progression. The idea of Vicky being a huge problem as a vampire because she's a drug addict, which now makes her a blood addict, is kind of stupid, but the show pulls a really clever twist on you by making you believe that Stefan will become her mentor and teach her how to control her thirst for blood, which is kind of expected since she's one of the main characters, but instead, Vicky becomes too uncontrollable and Stefan finds himself in a position where where his only option is to kill her, which he does. The overall romance of Stefan and Elena is alright, they have enough chemistry to make it work, which is funny because Nina Dobrev has opened up in the last few years about the fact that her and Paul Wesley actually really disliked each other during the filming of season 1. They did not get along, but they work well enough on screen. There's absolutely nothing complex about their relationship, it's really designed to emulate the codes of Twilight while taking elements of its own source material, but eh, I don't mind it. Learning more about Catherine and how dangerous and manipulative she was back when they knew her in 1864 is also very compelling. Knowing that both Damon and Stefan are still internally dealing with the fact that they were forced to love her because she used her power of compulsion on them is really sad. And it's even more sad to learn later on that Damon was actually never compelled by Catherine and his love for her was real the whole time. I like that neither of the brothers ever find out if Catherine was ever actually in love with them for real and the lack of closure has fucked with their heads for over a hundred years. She compelled us, we didn't have a choice. It took me years to sort that out to truly understand what she did to us. Oh no, Stefan. We are not taking that on tonight. And then, one of the big twists of the season comes in episode 14 when it's revealed that Catherine was never actually in the tomb with the other vampires. She actually managed to escape before it was sealed and she's just been living her life for the past century and Damon realizes in a heartbreaking way that everything he did to save her didn't matter. Not just because Catherine wasn't in the tomb, but because another vampire named Anna reveals to him that she saw Catherine back in 1983 and that Catherine knew that Damon was still alive and looking for her and she knew where he was but she just didn't care. That revelation completely destroys Damon's entire reality because he was convinced their love was real. He spent 145 years trying to get back to a love he did not realize was never reciprocated. 
That's rough, buddy. The one place where the season truly loses me is in the storyline with the tomb vampires. Once they get out of the tomb and return to Mystic Falls, there's a significant amount of time in the show devoted to them being in hiding and plotting to take over the town. And I gotta say, they are insanely boring. First of all, it's never really made clear what they're actually trying to do. Some of them want revenge on the town, yes, but the overarching plan led by the eldest, Pearl, is never fully explained explained to us, and she essentially gets defeated before we get a chance to get a proper explanation. Like the whole time she's there, we don't know what Pearl actually wants, it keeps changing, and then she just dies along with her friends. Oh hey, a new black character! Damn, there aren't a lot of them in this show, I can't wait to get to know him. I'm sure we- oh no, he's dead. Well. That's a bummer. I'm pretty sure that won't become a habit with this show though. I think we're fine. The entire plot line around the council was probably the worst part of the season as a whole. The council is essentially a group of adults from the founding families of Mystic Falls along with the mayor and the sheriff who know about vampires and stuff and they know that some vampires are back in Mystic Falls or whatever. Ugh, I hated it. They're the lamest group of antagonists ever. Most of their time on the show is dedicated to them sitting around in a room with glasses of bourbon and just plotting and scheming while regurgitating information we already know about the plot. They're unbelievably boring, I couldn't wait for them to die. Also, the whole storyline around Elena's biological parents is really annoying. There's a whole conspiracy theory segment halfway through the season that is just dropped. Eventually, Elena's mother comes to Mystic Falls. She's a vampire, big surprise. And it's the funniest thing ever because I'm sorry. But whoever played the role of Elena's mom, Isabel, is laughably bad in this role. It's actually hilarious. And beyond that, her entire presence in the show is just pointless. She's so overly villainous for no reason. And the scene where she finally meets Elena is just so underwhelming. All of that to have an extremely mid-emotional payoff in season 2 that is absolutely not earned and makes you feel like this character only existed in this show to waste your time in filler storylines. However, despite all of these problems, the season is all saved by Catherine. The arrival of Catherine in the finale is probably one of the best sequences in the entire show. Even this time, it genuinely blew me away. It's just such a cool reveal. The season spends an insurmountable amount of time building up to her arrival, and eventually she does arrive, and I think they did it in a way that immediately lets you know that everyone who has known Catherine in the past was right to be afraid of her. She is not somebody to be messed with, and they show you that right off the bat. Hello, John. Goodbye, John. I am such a sucker for a good character buildup. When everybody spends a significant amount of time talking about a character you never see, everyone is afraid of them, you don't fully understand why, and then you finally get to see them and you're like, oh shit. Ugh, I love that stuff. And Catherine is a perfect example of how to pull that off perfectly. I'll tip my hide off to the writers on this scene. They absolutely nailed the introduction of that character and it was the perfect way to end the season. Overall, I totally understand why this show caught on the way it did and I totally understand why I got so obsessed with it as a teenager. Season 1, while flawed, is super efficient and it is perfectly designed to tap into the angst of teenagers and the fantasy of a Twilight-like obsessive romance. It just works, it's the perfect amount of corniness and the perfect perfect amount of moodiness. Season 2 feels very similar to Season 1, it feels like a very natural continuation of the story. It picks up right after the end of Season 1, literally on the same night, and right off the bat, Season 2 changes the status quo drastically. Catherine is now here, in Mystic Falls, in the flesh, she drives Damon off the edge and he tries to kill Elena's little brother, she turns Caroline into a vampire, Tyler is turning into a werewolf, Jeremy recovers after trying to commit suicide in an attempt to become a vampire. Like, 
like everything starts insane immediately. A lot works this season. There's a great amount of stuff that I like. I really like the idea of Stefan becoming a mentor to Caroline after she becomes a vampire. I like the addition of Rose as a character. Her time on the show was short-lived, but really well-written. I like that Catherine, in all of her villainous presence, seems to be afraid of something, but we don't really know what or who. There's a lot of good stuff, but season two is also where the lasting problems with the Vampire Diaries start to show. This series has a lot of issues, a lot, and while they don't become overbearing until a while later, season two really is the gate that let them in. First off, I'm just gonna say it, I don't like the werewolves in this show, okay? I don't. They are so fucking lame. There's a bunch of them in this season, they're all terrible, and also, what the fuck, is that Oliver Queen? <laughs> However, if I can throw a bone to the werewolves, I will say that Tyler's first transformation is actually horrifying. I actually like this scene a lot. Like, holy shit, did they do a great job at portraying how horrible it is to turn into a werewolf. <laughs> The big goal of season 2 is to expand the mythology of the show, not only with the vampire lore, but with the werewolves and, in a minor way, with the witches. Because every season of the show has over 20 episodes, there is a lot that happens, and as a result, we are introduced to a lot of new characters that are only here to fill time or to serve as subpar love interests for main characters the writers don't really know what to do with. Oh, look, a new black character. Aw oh, man, it's been a while. I hope he- ah! No, he's dead. But at least his dad is still here. I'm sure we'll get to see him more in- <laughs> Well, okay. Better luck next time. Anyways, as I was saying, the show introduces us to a lot of new characters, or brings back older ones that I never liked anyways. I absolutely hate John Gilbert as a character. I find him relentlessly annoying, and I'm glad he fucking dies at the end of it. I don't care for Anna or her mom. Frankly, any character that is directly linked to Jeremy Gilbert can die. They never serve any purpose in this story. Isabel is still one of the most ridiculous characters this show ever created. I'm glad she dies too and I'm really glad we never see her again. But season two is much more about the villains than it is about the heroes, and that's where Catherine comes in. Like I said earlier, Catherine's introduction scene is some of the most badass shit this show has ever done. It really does a great job at showing you in a brutal way the monster you've been hearing about throughout all of season one. So I was really, really excited to see what she would do in season two, to see how she would impact the show. The issue though is that once introduced, Catherine's antics quickly get boring. And I hate to say that, because I believe Catherine is simply the best character in The Vampire Diary. And I know, I know, this is going to be a controversial opinion or whatever, and I understand if you disagree with me on that, because while I think Catherine is the best character on the show, I also think she was never really used correctly. Let me explain. Catherine is an extremely fascinating character with an insane amount of potential. And with all the shit people give to Nina Dobrev for her bad acting, I think she actually makes Catherine very fun to watch. She gives her a really entertaining snarkiness that makes her personality stand out. But unfortunately, I think the writers completely failed that character. They could have used the device of Catherine pretending to be Elena in a much smarter way. They could have easily created an atmosphere of distrust and doubt with the audience. They could have literally made a mind-bending season where whenever you see Nina Dobrev on screen, you can't tell if it's Elena or Catherine. You could have a scene where Elena is hanging out with Bonnie, talking about whatever is going on, but even after the scene ends, you'd be wondering if that was actually Elena. The concept of Catherine being in Mystic Falls was brilliant, especially given how everybody talked about how much of a trickster she was. But the way they went about executing that idea was really stupid. Catherine's tricks are really cheap and short-lived. A scene will start and you'll see Elena talking with someone, but then they give it away immediately because a creepy song starts to play and you immediately know it's not Elena. So her tricks don't feel like the intelligence of the character is being used with a purpose in mind, it just feels like a dumb gimmick she uses on everyone for no real reason, and it goes completely against what the character is supposed to be. The whole thing about Catherine is that she's incredibly calculated, she's always six moves ahead of everything 
everybody. There's very few people in this universe that can outsmart her. And it's not like she only relies on her wit. Catherine is also a great fighter. And not a lot of people who try to kill her can live to tell the tale. There's an episode in season 2 where she takes on Damon and Stefan at the same time and she's beating them easily. Yo, yo, don't do it! Don't do it! Yo! Yo, holy shit, he dead! Oh, he dead for sure! She does pull a few amazing tricks, like when we find out that the reason she knew everything that was happening around the characters, even when she had no way of knowing, is because she actually compelled Jenna to become her eyes and ears the very first time she walked into the Gilbert house at the end of season one, and that Jenna had essentially been her spy the entire time. That was really good, because when you go back after that, you realize that there are some very clever seeds planted to set up that twist. The show lets you know every time Jenna knows notices something, but it's always done in an innocent way or a comedic way so you don't think about it twice, but the sequence is here for a specific reason. That's a very well executed element of Catherine's intelligence, but again, those moments are a minority in her time on the show. So yeah, unfortunately, Catherine is a great character that was completely wasted in this show. I know eventually she stops appearing as often in the show because the writers realize that shooting scenes with Catherine and Elena in the same place was an absolute nightmare logistically. It was incredibly difficult and because they had to shoot every scene twice, one time with Elena and one time with Catherine because they're both played by Nina Dobrev, it became too much of a nightmare on the scheduling of the shoot. So as a result, they decided to start writing less Catherine into the show and only have her appear occasionally, which in the end was probably a good thing because I have a feeling they would have ruined that character over time. But anyways, we'll talk about Catherine more later. Rude. I'd say season 2 starts to drag a bit in the middle. The pacing of this season is definitely not as tight as season 1. It feels a bit more messy. The Warlock storyline that comes to a head halfway through is really here just to waste time. But season 2 of the Vampire Diaries has a very specific goal, and that is, yes, to expand the mythology, which will end up becoming the show's biggest weakness, but we'll talk about that more later. But more specifically, season 2 is here to introduce us to the Michaelsons more famously known as The Originals. For the uninitiated, let me tell you about them. The Originals, as their name suggests, are the first vampires. They're essentially the ultimate eldest, the strongest, the fastest. They're like super vampires, if you want. And their powers are slightly different from regular vampires. They can do more things, but also they are immune to a lot of weaknesses known to other vampires. For example, an original cannot be killed by the sunlight. They can freely walk in the sun, they're fine they won't burst on fire. Also, an original cannot be killed by a stake through the heart. If you try to kill one that way, you'll probably just slow it down, it'll be dead for a few minutes, and then it will come back to life as if nothing happened. An original also cannot be killed by fire. Their bodies are essentially indestructible. Same goes for a werewolf bite. We learned throughout season 2 that if a vampire is bitten by a werewolf, they're essentially done for. It's fatal. It kind of makes you sick for a couple days, you become completely delirious, and then you dead. But while the bite may hurt an original, they cannot die from it. It's not fatal to them. But as I said, they also have some extra abilities that other vampires don't have. For example, vampires can use their powers of compulsion to make humans do whatever they want just by saying it out loud. I need you to pick a fight with someone. A kid named Tyler Lockwood. Get him mad. Don't back down no matter what he does, okay? I won't back down. I know you won't. However, the originals are the only vampires who can use that power to compel other vampires. It's like they have an extra level of skill with it. So the originals are a family, the Michelson family. There's two parents who had seven children, five of which became the first vampires. That said though, while the originals are all extremely powerful, everyone fears one of them in particular. Klaus. Klaus Michelson is probably known as the most iconic villain in the entire show. In season 2, he gets a Catherine treatment. For most of the season, we hear his name a lot, everybody talks about him, and every single person that mentions his name seems to be completely terrified of him. We even find out Klaus is the one Catherine is afraid of. She's trying to run away from him, and she's been doing so for 500 years. And that's significant for us as the audience, because it's the first time we see Catherine 
Catherine genuinely scared of something. And for good reason, because we find out that the reason why everyone is so afraid of Klaus is that Klaus is not only a vampire, he's a hybrid. Klaus is half vampire, half werewolf, which essentially makes him the most powerful creature in the world. But I won't be covering the originals entirely today. Nope, they will get their own video. But I will say this, I do like that Klaus got the same type of buildup Catherine got in season one, especially because Klaus delivers on the payoff way more than Catherine ever did. My only gripe with the way they handle Klaus is that I think officially introducing him to the audience by making him possess Alaric's body was a stupid idea. Because Joseph Morgan is too good in this role, and they should have let him be the first introduction. But eh, whatever. Once Klaus is truly here, in his body, it's absolute mayhem, and I love it. I just really like how Klaus completely shifts the status quo of the show, and how he truly feels like a real, impactful danger for the main characters. First off, they establish right off the bat that there is no such thing as taking Klaus in a fight. Nobody can take him in a fight, especially not one-on-one. -on -one. He will end you in six seconds without breaking a sweat. You can't fight him. But the thing I like the most about that is that they also cannot outsmart him. He has a plan he has been working on for a thousand years. He has anticipated every possible hiccup that could come his way. He's a million steps ahead of everybody. And he doesn't give a fuck. At the end of season two, Stefan comes to strike a deal with Klaus to save Jenna's life. He offers to become the vampire sacrifice for Klaus's ritual, and Klaus gives so little fucks that he just snaps Stefan's neck after breaking his spine, and then he kills Jenna anyway. That is so metal, you gotta respect it. And yeah, I completely forgot that Jenna gets rocked at the end of season two. Like, she fully dies, and she's dead for good. Good. See, in later seasons, death on the Vampire Diaries becomes the most meaningless concept ever. Probably more so than any other show in existence, and that's not an exaggeration, I mean that. And since the last seasons are the ones that were the freshest in my memory, I genuinely forgot this show had some level of stakes in the first couple of seasons. Vicky died, Lexi died, Jenna died, John Gilbert died, and those are permanent as hell. They're dead. But Jenna was the one that probably surprised surprised me the most. Dying in such a brutal way at the hands of Klaus was a really effective moment. It makes the characters and the audience alike feel completely hopeless. And that is my favorite part about Klaus and his storyline in season 2. The whole story of the show, from the moment he is first mentioned early in the season, is about finding a way to stop him. But at the end of the season, Klaus wins. He is undefeated. He actually executes his plan and becomes even more invincible than he already was. And every single person he intended to kill, including some of the main characters, are dead. That's actually pretty rare in a show like this, because usually you just know the heroes will save the day, but no. Season 2 ends with the heroes failing to stop the catastrophe they spent the whole season trying to prevent. They lose. Klaus is just completely unstoppable and he pretty oh hey a new black character oh man it's been a while i can't wait to get to know her it's gonna be really nice oh brother this guy stinks anyways klaus is a great character a lot of people say he's the best villain on the show but because of the direction his character takes in later seasons and his spin-off show where he becomes more of a ruthless anti-hero i have a hard time looking at klaus as a full-fledged villain but yes in season two he is an amazing antagonist and i think he easily is one of the best parts of this entire series however season two is far from perfect and this this is where I start to hate a lot of elements about this show. First off, re-watching it as an adult, it's difficult not to constantly be reminded of the fact that this is essentially a show about a bunch of people who are hundreds of years old being romantically obsessed with 16 and 17 year olds. It's weird no matter how you try to look at it. Klaus falling in love with 17 year old Caroline at the tender age of 1000 is very 
very weird to me. Stefan is like 160-ish and he falls in love like a madman with 17-year-old Elena. And even if you take away the vampire element, Damon is also 160-ish, but he's supposed to be frozen at the age of 25 and he still falls in love with an underage girl. He also sleeps with a bunch of underage girls, including Vicky Donovan and Caroline. Secondly, season two is where the romantic storylines in general become a little too overbearing. There's too many romantic subplots and none of them are really good. This might be an unpopular opinion, but an overwhelming majority of the romantic relationships in The Vampire Diaries are really fucking lame and completely pointless. And unfortunately, it does not get better with season three. I think that for the majority of people, it wouldn't be the craziest thing to say that season three of The Vampire Diaries is the best season of the show. I do think it has glaring weaknesses that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, but I really think the show is at its strongest in this era. Season three picks up a couple months after the events of season two. At the very end of that season, Damon is bitten by a werewolf and he's dying. Stefan, who is desperate to save his life, learns that Klaus's blood is the only cure to a werewolf's bite. So getting his blood is the only way to save Damon. As a result, Stefan strikes a deal with Klaus and in exchange for Damon's life, he agrees to shut his humanity off and leave town with Klaus as his right hand man. Oh yeah, um, vampires have the ability to switch off their emotions, which makes them unable to feel love or guilt or anything. And generally when that happens, they turn into merciless killing machines. At first it's pitched like a metaphor, but as the show goes, it becomes very literal. They can switch off their emotions in two seconds, and if you ask me, that's pretty fucking stupid. However, despite it being stupid, I'm just gonna say right away. I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion, but I don't care. The duo of Klaus and Stefan with his humanity off is really fucking cool. They are so fucking badass together, it's so entertaining. Like literally, they could have made the whole season about them and I would have been completely fine. By your type are very hard to come by. I wouldn't do that. Vampires. It's swifty swift, right? Yes. And this new status quo makes for some insanely interesting backstories. There's some fun things we learned about this universe's past. We learned that the originals are actually terrified of someone, and they've essentially been on the run for a thousand years. At first, we don't really know what or who they're running from, but later in the season, we find out they're running from Michael, their own father. Michael is a vampire who hunts vampires. He wants to exterminate his children because he thinks vampires are an abomination of nature. Nature. He's extremely powerful and he doesn't drink human blood. In fact, Michael is the only vampire who feeds on the blood of other vampires. It's a cool setup that was a fun series of reveals. It's also really fun to find out that the famous Vervain necklace Stefan gives to Elena in season one actually belonged to Rebecca Michelson, Klaus's sister, who lost it back in the 1920s, which also serves as a great revelation that Stefan had actually met the originals way before the year 2010 when they fight Klaus and Elijah. He just didn't know he was with the original vampires. He even had a romance with Rebecca, but he doesn't remember that because Klaus also wiped all memory of himself and his sister from Stefan's mind. However, getting scenes revealing that Stefan and Klaus were actually best friends at some point was kind of amazing. Also, seeing Stefan as a serial killer vampire in the 1920s is also really fun because he's so fundamentally good in the present day, I was doubtful of how willing the writers would be to make him villainous in flashbacks, but they actually commit to it. I gotta give them that. Ripper Stefan is one cruel motherfucker, and they didn't lie when they said he was worse than Damon ever was. I am so sorry, sweetheart. Are we offending you? <laughs> the big problem of season three is that it's the season where a lot of the mythology starts to become very flaky. And the more you think about the rules of the show's universe, the more you realize a lot of it doesn't actually make any fucking sense. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, you know that bad world building is a particular pet peeve of mine. And unfortunately, The Vampire Diaries is pretty much the Olympic gold medalist of bad world building. The way Julie Pleck and her writer 
characters crash the lore of this show into the fucking ground is spectacular to me. Season 3 really is the point where the show starts to make up a lot of shit that completely breaks the consistency of the lore. Shit just kinda happens, the writers desperately want to go bigger with each storyline, so things become more and more ridiculous, the problems the characters have to face are getting so big that it just sounds really stupid, and unfortunately the writers are also not that good at coming up with solutions for those problems. Like they will create a problem for the characters without thinking about its solution and they try to figure out the solution way later and they don't know what to do. As a result, the longer the show goes, the more the resolutions of the storylines become increasingly unsatisfying because it always seems like it comes out of nowhere. One of the stupidest concepts this show ever created was the sire line plot. Oh my fucking god, just thinking about it makes me want to vomit. Basically, Julie Plague decided that every vampire in existence is part of a sire line. The idea is that the originals are essentially the ancestors of every vampire. They all descend from one of the originals. So, if you manage to kill an original definitively, every vampire that comes for their sire line will also die. In other words, if you kill all five of the originals, you eradicate the vampire species. It's a really stupid idea, I think it's so lame, but it takes such a big part of the last chunk of the season that it's impossible to ignore. And the dumbest part of it is that this incredibly crucial information about the sire lines is just forgotten. Like Julie Plague just forgot that was a thing over time, and the worst part of it is, it never actually leads to anything, because the writers don't have the balls to go there anyway. And that's not even it. I think one of the big biggest weaknesses of the Vampire Diaries is the writer's inability to let certain characters go. From season 1, the show has had too many characters, but that number just keeps increasing over time because characters just kinda stick around forever. Julie Plague does this thing where she introduces a character that is only supposed to be here for a short period of time, sometimes even one episode, but then she gets too attached to the character and the actor playing the character, so she decides to not write that character off the show like it was originally planned and just keeps them in even if there's absolutely nothing for them to do in the story. Julie, you all have talked about this a lot, but so he was supposed to die, die at the end of that episode, right? Yeah, I, uh, I think originally when we, when we wrote it, we were, you know, the plan was to kill him. And then we thought, well, actually we could use this villain as a bridge villain until we introduced Klaus. And so we just started keeping him as in the story so that we were just kind of filling time because we didn't want to have the Klaus reveal until the end of the season. That happened a lot, didn't it? Where like people would come in for a quick little whatever and then you guys would fall in love with them and write a whole spinoff series for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a perfect example. Klaus. The story of Klaus and the originals was initially meant to come to an end in season 3. That was the arc. Klaus wins at the end of season 2 and he actually defeats the heroes and season 3 was then going to be about the heroes picking themselves up and coming back with an iron fist to defeat him for good. Like Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. If you ask me, it was a great idea for an arc. It would have been a memorable epic battle against a formidable villain that truly got the heroes to struggle. I think it would have made Klaus an even more iconic villain of television. But Julie Plague got too obsessed with the character, and also with Elijah, who was originally supposed to be in only one episode, and she decided not to have that story come to an end. As a result, the last part of season 3 feels like a bit of a disjointed mess that ends with nobody really being the villain. Like they make Alaric a bad guy to replace Klaus, who seemingly dies except his consciousness was moved into another body by Bonnie, and so dumb. It's the laziest cop-out ending they could have given this season. And it's such a gigantic disservice to the story of season 3. And then, in season 4, the originals are just chilling. The story now has to find a reason to keep them in Mystic Falls, and they just kind of stay around. And they don't do anything, really? Klaus is there, just hanging out without much of a plan. He's here with his hybrids. So is Rebecca, and they never do anything. They just 
exist in the show and they feel so out of place in the story because they are they are out of place in the story because they weren't supposed to be in the story anymore the story of season four never has anything to do with them so they just become background characters who are just waiting to fuck off for their spin-off i hate it it's not that hard julie pull it together season three only has a somewhat impactful ending because the fake death of klaus results in rebecca killing elena by causing a car crash but what rebecca didn't know or what nobody knew at the time was that elena had vampire blood in her system when she died meaning the season ends with her waking up as a vampire I'll admit, that was a solid twist for the show standards. I kinda hate the parallel of Elena asking Stefan to save Matt's life first being treated as a full circle moment to make up for the death of her parents. I think that was an insanely stupid writing choice that is unbelievably misguided. And I also don't understand why Stefan, a vampire with the ability to move faster than a regular human and to be stronger than any regular human, could not save both of them at the same time or use his super super speed to go back to get Elena. But disregarding all of that, Elena waking up as a vampire is a great way to end this era of the show, which in my opinion is the last era that is even worth watching. Oh fuck. This is where the show starts to make me hate myself for watching it. Posted on Jupiter in my zone. Stuck in my own head or on my phone. I hear blue laughing on her own But I was never scared to be alone I would rather die than fuck with you Angry thunderbolt like Pikachu Good day for midlife crisis 164 years, I'd say you're due. This is the point where the seasons of the show start blending together, and not in a good way. It's also the point where the show just stops being good altogether. Some people say that season four was the last inkling of good in the Vampire Diaries, but I kinda, sorta, completely disagree. Sorta, kinda, maybe. I'll just say it very bluntly. Season four is the point where the Vampire Diaries is officially running out of of ideas, which is a huge problem because we are only halfway through the show. Last year, I made a video about Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, and in it, I talked about the very fine line that exists between ridiculous and stupid. When it comes to movies and television, and all sorts of media for that matter, I think there is a very fine line between ridiculous and stupid. And let me be very clear, ridiculous can be good. It's fun, it's an element of the story that's needed to achieve a certain tone. Pirates of the Caribbean is ridiculous. Buffy the Vampire Slayer is ridiculous. Kingsman is ridiculous. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is ridiculous. Doctor Who is ridiculous, and that's fine. I'm okay with space wizards fighting with laser swords. It works, it's fun. But sometimes the people behind those entities kind of get carried away and they cross the line that stands between being ridiculous and being stupid. Pirates of the Caribbean crossed that line in movie four. Kingsman crossed that line after the first movie and Chilling Adventures of Sabrina crossed that line in season three. And I believe this perfectly applies here. I think up to that point, seasons one, two, and three of The Vampire Diaries were ridiculous, clearly. It was out there and not everything about it worked, but it was sort of fun and engaging in some ways. Season four, however, is where this show becomes stupid. It's where The Vampire Diaries officially becomes a bad show. Season four from the jump is just so fucking underwhelming. Literally, just episode one one had me rolling my eyes. Not only because some storylines that were already running for way too long carried over, but also because the writers decide to double down on some of the most awful elements of the show so far. Elena is choosing whether or not she wants to complete her transition into a vampire, which is fine, okay. Klaus is still alive, but living inside of Tyler's body, which is just so stupid as a plot point, so we have to deal with that. And the pastor of Mystic Falls becomes the leader of the council. Yeah, the council is back. You having fun yet? And this time around, the council know who every vampire in town is, and they plot to kill all of the originals to wipe the vampire race out of existence. Ugh. 
This season is gonna suck ass, to be honest. I don't even want- Oh! Hey! A new black character! Huh, that's great! I can't wait- ah! Jesus, really? It's like, I'm, I'm sensing a pattern here. Is it just me? This season introduces a lot of terrible lore that kind of ruin most of the mythology of the show. The Brotherhood of the Five is really dumb, and the fact that it's mostly used to give something to do to Jeremy really annoys me because who cares about Jeremy? I believe season four is also the season that introduces the cure to vampirism, which is by far one of the most pointless and annoying and inconsistent storylines in the entire show. It is so incredibly bad and it goes on for so long. Elena being sired to Damon was weirdly gross. I really hated that. And we're also introduced to one of the worst characters this show has ever brought us, Atticus Shane, a professor who is trying to bring his wife and son back to life. And he's just the biggest waste of time this show has all of that to essentially bring us to who i believe is to this day my least favorite character in the entire tvd universe silas the first immortal <sighs> I want to die. Guys, I cannot even begin to explain how much I hate Silas. The reason why is because on his own, Silas as a character represents everything wrong with the writers of this fucking show, and Julie Pleck more specifically. He makes my blood boil every time I think about his storyline on the show. And look, let's be honest, this show has a lot of plot holes, and I mean a lot, but I let it slide. There are a lot of plot holes in this story that I noticed and went, oh, that was stupid, but then I closed my eyes and pretended I didn't see it because it's not the end of the world. For the quick example, in season one, Stefan reveals to Damon that he was the last one to see Catherine before she was buried in 1864. That was like a whole thing that kind of changed the perception of Damon in terms of his love story with Catherine. He thought he was the last one to see her, but it turns out Stefan was, and Stefan implies that this encounter was romantic. Except that's not true, because in season two, we find out that the last time Stefan saw Catherine, he was with Damon. They saw her together. They were trying to rescue her from being taken by the townspeople, and then they got shot, and they died, and then they woke up as vampires. There, plot hole, inconsistency in the story. But I kind of have to let it slide, because with the Vampire Diaries and these writers specifically, if if I focus too much on that, I'm gonna go crazy because these types of plot holes are everywhere in this story. Nothing actually makes sense. So, you know, while plot holes are a personal pet peeve of mine, in order to enjoy the show, I'm willing to let it slide. But this shit? This shit? I am not letting slide, my guy. The first issue that arises with Silas, before we even meet him, is this problem I have with Julie Plex writing that I like to call the Bigger, Badder, Older Paradox, or BBOP if you prefer. You see, Julie Plex is one of those writers who really seems to believe that bigger always equals better. So in season one, we go against Catherine, who is one of the most notorious vampires in the world. In season two, we gotta go bigger, so this time we are not dealing Dealing with a notoriously dangerous vampire, we are dealing with the first vampires ever, the original. But then we gotta go bigger, so we meet the oldest vampire who is also a werewolf. And then in season three, we gotta go bigger, so we're going after the original witch who is even older and better than the vampire werewolf. And now in season four, we gotta go even bigger. So now we're going against another immortal that is bigger, badder, and older than the originals, even though they already said that the originals were the oldest immortals, but I guess it just retconned that. Because yes, in fact, he was the first person to ever be immortal, and it keeps going like this. Every season, Julie Plek introduces a villain that is the oldest and most villainous creature, but then the season after that, she's like, but here's 
here's another villain who is even more evil and older than the oldest villain from last season. And then the season after that, she's like, psych, there's an even older one. And he's super duper evil. And Silas is easily the worst of them all. He bothers me so much. Secondly, Silas completely breaks the mythology of the doppelganger in a way that really annoys me. See, in seasons one and two, we learn that Elena is a unique supernatural being called the Petrova Doppelganger, a mystical replica of Katerina Petrova, aka Catherine. We also find out that Catherine had a secret daughter before becoming a vampire, and the show explains Elena's existence by tying her back to Catherine's lineage. Long story short, Catherine became an immortal being, and nature essentially balanced itself by recreating Catherine's body in one of her descendants, aka Elena. Why did nature wait 500 years to do that? I don't know, and I don't think the writers know either. But anyways, the point is, Elena is a unique rebalancing of nature. She is the doppelganger. She's like legendary to most supernatural creatures. Klaus even needs her blood to break the werewolf curse in season two. Why does he need the blood of a doppelganger? I don't know, and I don't think the writers know either. But then, in season four, it's revealed that Stefan is also a doppelganger, and the original being is Silas. And it gives us the most idiotic backstory that makes me want to shoot myself. Basically, we find out that Elena is not the first doppelganger of her line. Catherine herself is a doppelganger of another woman named Amara, who was born over 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece. And Amara fell in love with Silas. But Silas was supposed supposed to get married to another woman named Ketsia, who was a witch. Silas tricked her into giving him an elixir to make them immortal on their wedding day. But he then gave the elixir to Amara instead, and they became the first immortals. And as a result of them becoming immortals, nature had to create a balance and decided to recreate the bodies of Amara and Silas in mortal beings over and over again, every generation and every copy is meant to be soulmates and they will find themselves at one point or another or some shit. Oh my god, that's so fucking stupid. But the stupidest part about it, and the part that makes me really annoyed at the writer's incompetence, and strap in because this shit is crazy, is that this new lore that completely invalidates everything we knew about the show prior to this implies that Elena and Catherine are descendants of Amara, and that Stefan is a descendant of Silas. But that doesn't make any sense? Do you know why? Because we know their lives. We know how their story ended in ancient Greece. They didn't have children. They were put to sleep for 2,000 years without having kids. So how do they have descendants? They never had children. And this one oversight right there, this one plot hole makes it impossible for the entirety of the Vampire Diaries to even exist. I'm not kidding. It is canonically impossible for the events of this show to take place in any capacity. Because if we follow the logic of Silas's backstory, that means the show can't happen because the Salvators are descendants of Silas, but Silas never had kids, which means Damon and Stefan cannot exist. And Elena is a descendant of Amara, but Amara never had kids, which means both Elena and Catherine cannot exist. And boom, right there, the entirety of season one has just been erased. It is canonically impossible for season one to happen, which means nothing in the show can happen. Do you get why I hate the existence of Silas in this show now? He is a walking plot hole. Nothing about him makes sense. And his very existence completely erases the entirety of the story itself. Get your shit together, Julie. 
It's not that hard! And what I absolutely hate about his backstory, aside from the obvious abundance of plot holes, is that not only does it take away the agency of the characters and the lore, it also completely invalidates the relationship of Stefan and Elena, because by that logic, it wasn't true love. It was forced love by the hands of... nature? <laughs> Oh my god, fuck this show. But anyways, back to Silas. Silas, like Klaus, gets the Catherine treatment throughout season 4. We don't actually get to meet him until much later in the season, but everybody is talking about him and he's apparently very scary. He's been asleep in a tomb for 2000 years and eventually he wakes up, he finally appears in present day at the end of season 4, and then he does absolutely nothing and he's killed off like five episodes into season five and then nobody ever mentions him again it's like he was never there he doesn't have any impact on this fucking show he's the most pointless character ever first of all and that's because the writers are terrible at their job but i hate the lack of consistency in silas and his circumstances and i know this is sort of nitpicking i know but i couldn't not notice it silas has been asleep for two thousand years and then he wakes up in the year 2011 or something and he's like completely fine with the way the world has changed like he just knows how to drive a car he's not even phased by the concept of a car for a guy who has only ever known ancient greece you would think the world around him would freak him the fuck out but no he immediately knows how to drive he's not bothered by buses or airplanes he also knows how to use a cell phone the fact that he even understands the concept of a telephone is mind-blowing to me it makes no sense he even talks like he's from 2011 the writers didn't even bother to give him old dialogue i mean sure it also doesn't make sense that we see flashbacks of him in ancient greece where everybody speaks perfect american english but god damn do something to make him stand out holy shit it's like the writers didn't even try oh okay I'm, do I'm done talking about him you get the gist i hate season four it's stupid season five is easily the most forgettable season of the entire show literally i just watched it twice for this video and i already don't remember what happens in it after the embarrassing excuse for a storyline that was the silas arc we are introduced to the main antagonist of season five a group of witches known as the travelers and if season five is the most forgettable season of the vampire diary the Travelers are by far the most forgettable antagonist this show has ever had. I can't remember a single thing they do in this season. I don't even remember any of their names and there's like 20 of them. I don't even really want to talk about this season because nothing notable really happens in it. I guess it introduces the character of Enzo, which hot take. I don't care about Enzo. He's just not that good of a character. He's another example of a character that was only supposed to be around for a few episodes but Julie Plyke got attached because he's hot so he just sticks around and does a whole lot of nothing until he dies later in the show. He has no real reason to be here. Klaus was the cool sexy British vampires fans adored but he left to have his own spin-off so Enzo who is also British becomes his replacement by proxy and I think he is completely pointless. Aside from him arriving in the show though you can literally skip season five and it will have zero repercussions on your comprehension of the show it's like a weird side quest that has no real impact on the story the stakes are also completely non-existent now like i said after a while the concept of death in tvd is completely meaningless you watch main characters get their necks snapped in every single episode they always come back people get stabbed hearts get ripped out some characters die several times in the same episodes and they still come back it's just so empty by that point you watch these characters die so much that it just doesn't mean anything anymore it's really difficult to have stakes when every single character in your story is literally immortal because yeah the show is completely bogged down by the fact that literally every character in the story is a supernatural being now except for mad donovan like he's the only character that stays human the whole show it was kind of a meme during its run but nobody cares about mad 
Matt, leave me alone. In season one, everybody was human except for Stefan and Damon, and then Bonnie was a witch, and that was kind of it. But now, the show is exclusively composed of supernatural characters. No one is just human. And it takes so much away from the mystical element of the story, because if everyone is special, then nobody is. Having very few supernatural beings causing havoc in the painfully normal life of the characters was a huge part of the charm in season one. And you definitely feel the difference now. Every character is a fucking superhero and it just doesn't have the same impact. Anyway, season five is a snooze fest, you can skip it. Season six is a definite improvement over seasons four and five, but it's still really bad. This season mostly deals with a group of witches known as the Gemini Coven, and it also deals with Damon and Bonnie being stuck in a form of purgatory of supernatural prison for a long period of time and they become best friends and people were really upset that they didn't get together romantically because they had good chemistry. I personally think it's really nice this show gave us a true platonic friendship between two characters of opposite genders that was a main part of the show. I've talked about this before but I hate it when shows see that a male character and a female character have the slightest bit of chemistry on screen and immediately go oh we have to make this a romantic storyline now but no they don't and i personally really appreciate platonic relationships between a male and a female character that are in the front of the story because it's rare and yes i am aware that the reason they didn't go there with bonnie is due to another reason that i will talk about later but i still liked it and the people who constantly whine about bonnie and damon not having sex need to calm the fuck down a relationship being platonic does not make it lesser than and just like most of the romantic relationships in this show, Bonnie and Damon falling in love would not have made any sense for their characters, and I will die on that hill. Anyways, from what I understand, season 6 tends to be liked by many for one character in particular who serves as the main antagonist of the season. His name is Kai, and here's another hot take for you. I don't like Kai. He is not a good villain, I'm sorry. I think the main reason why people like Kai so much is not actually due to his character being good, it's just because he's played by Chris Wood, who is insanely charismatic. Hello? Not everyone died? I had a soft spot for one of my sisters, so otherwise I would have cut her lungs out and not just her spleen. What? You can survive without a spleen. He really embodies this character in a way that makes him stand out. He makes him fun and he's witty. Like, I understand that. I really like Chris Wood. I think he's a very underrated actor. But aside from Kai being charismatic, what 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 is so interesting about him? His story kind of sucks. The whole point of Kai is that he's a psychopath who enjoys killing people and he murdered his family. Cool. He's basically every generic villain ever. The only difference is that Chris Wood smirks with every single line he delivers. Wow. After a while, all he does is be a snarky asshole. Sure, he's powerful, but in the grand scheme of things, he doesn't really do that much. And as an antagonist, he doesn't hold a candle to the likes of Catherine or Klaus or even Damon in season one. I don't understand why people love Kai so much. I don't even think they actually love Kai. I think they just enjoy Chris Wood's performance as the character. But if you take one step back from it and actually look at the character like on paper you realize that Chris Wood is really good in a role that is terribly written but despite the fact that it is also fairly forgettable season six is unlike season five actually important to the story mainly because of the fact that it marks a big change in the show's DNA season six was the last season on the contracts of the original cast and if there was to be a season seven which there was all the main actors on the show needed to renew their contracts and they all did except for Nina Dobrev. Nina decided to leave the show after season six, and so the writers had to find a way to write Elena out of the show without killing her off, so she could easily return if Nina ever decided to come back. So, the concept they created is as follows. Kai essentially puts Elena in a magical coma. It's a sleeping curse. Elena cannot wake up, and her life is now tied to Bonnie, meaning Elena will only wake up from her coma when Bonnie dies. Okay, sure. It's not the greatest idea, but they could have done way worse, so I'll let it slide. And in a way, it's kind of- Oh, hey! A new black character- <laughs> 
Come on! That said, though, Elena leaving the show is the only thing that makes season 6 matter. Even though by that point, Elena was not nearly as relevant to the story as she was in the first, like, four seasons. But she was still the central character for some reason. So I remember people being very excited to see how the show would follow her departure. People were excited to see who would become the central character of the show. And everyone was very anxious to see if Julie Plek could make it work. Spoiler alert, she couldn't. It didn't work. I'm going to go through these seasons very fast because, frankly, there isn't all that much to say about them. Elena's gone, everybody is really sad, Stefan and Damon essentially become the main characters of the show, and nothing, and I mean nothing, about this show makes any sense anymore. And the story is as boring as ever. In season 7, we're kind of dealing with Lily the whole time. Oh yeah, um, I forgot to mention. Stefan and Damon have a mother. And and she also is a vampire, because everyone in this fucking show is immortal, apparently. Her name is Lily Salvatore, and she's the leader of a group of witch-vampire hybrids known as the Heretics, and they're evil for no reason. They don't really have any real motivations. I guess they want the town. They want to take over Mystic Falls. Why? I don't know, and I don't think the writers know either. The heretics are essentially just a repeat of the tomb vampires from season one, except they're somehow even more boring. They did try to make some of them sassy, but the acting is so awkward. Anyway, season seven kind of deals with a dual timeline. There's a first timeline that takes place right after Elena takes a nap, which is what we consider present day and then a second timeline that takes place three years after that, and they overlap and shit. This season is excruciatingly bad. It's definitely the show at its worst. And it is riddled with inconsistencies and plot holes and the laziest character work yet. But I will say, it was funny for me to notice that season seven is not made worse than the previous seasons because Elena is no longer here. The story of the season is just terrible, but Elena Elena's absence has nothing to do with it. In fact, I think the season would have been worse if she had been there. Like, I wasn't missing her at all. They talk about her all the time, especially in the beginning of the season, but like, the show is perfectly fine without her. Eventually, the story starts dealing with a supernatural vampire huntress who doesn't have much of a personality, and I also don't remember her name, and I don't care to look it up. But overall, I don't have much to say about season 7. It's there. It exists. It's completely unnecessary. It's way too long. The writing is laughable. The show feels so tired of itself. It tries so hard to have stakes, but there's just nothing there. It's kind of sad to look at it because by that point, The Vampire Diaries is so far past its prime that it should just allow itself to die, but it doesn't because there is season eight. Yay, somebody kill me. Season 8 is the final season of The Vampire Diaries, and I absolutely hate it. I hate everything about it. By that point, the show is a pale shadow of its former self. It has never felt this dead or this lazy. It is hanging on by a thread. The story of the show doesn't make any sense anymore. It hasn't made sense in a while, actually. And the whole mythology is so needlessly convoluted and so needlessly all over the place that it all sounds like gibberish now. Literally, the story of season 8 is about Damon and Stefan facing off sirens, mystical creatures who are trying to rebuild a magical bell that belonged to the founders of Mystic Falls, and they are harvesting souls and are planning to ring that bell to open a gate to hell so that a guy named Arcadius can come out and create some havoc or whatever. Oh, and I forgot to mention, 
Arcadius is the devil. Okay, first of all, I just want to say, this isn't the show's worst idea. After every creature the characters took on over the years, the ghosts, the witches, the werewolves, the vampires, the immortals, the avengers, all of it, it's not an inherently terrible idea to make the devil the final boss of the show. On paper, it kind of makes sense. But in the show, it doesn't make sense. Because the show doesn't really want to commit to Arcadius being the actual devil, so they had to make up a whole story for how he became the way he is, and it just doesn't really work. The one redeeming quality of season 8 is the fact that it only has 16 episodes instead of the usual 22. That's a big win. Honestly, this season only exists as a desperate attempt to put this show out of its misery with at least some sort of dignity, but it does not succeed at doing that. So yeah, yeah, this season has Damon, Stefan, and company finding sirens and eventually taking on the devil. And like I said, their take on the devil is actually really underwhelming. Basically, Arcadius, or Cade as they call him, was a witch and he was burnt at the stake like a really long time ago. So as he was burning, he screamed and he screamed so hard that he created another dimension. And that dimension is hell. <laughs> I know it sounds like I just made that up, but I swear that's his backstory. So basically, he made a whole plan to like, I don't know, take over the world or whatever. Like, there's a gate from hell that was open and some of the old villains of the show escaped from hell. There's a whole thing. And we have to stop Cade. Ooh, Cade is so dangerous and he's so powerful. Ooh. But then none of it matters because it turns out the entire season was orchestrated by Catherine from hell. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Basically, we find out that the devil was just a pawn for the real mastermind behind everything. Catherine. Yep, they essentially throw out the entire story of season 8 out the window and just go, Catherine was behind all of it because of reasons. So what is Catherine's grandmaster plan here? Get ready for this one, guys. It's a doozy. Catherine wants to blow up Mystic Falls and that's it. She just wants to burn down the entire town with hellfire. That's her entire plan. But that's not the funniest part because one, Catherine shows up and goes, Mystic Falls will burn at 10 p.m. Why 10 p.m.? Why not just blow it up now? I don't know. And I don't think the writers know either. None of the circumstances in the finale make any sense, but eventually the heroes win because of course they do. And then we have the stupidest resolution of the entire show. See, because Elena was asleep for two seasons, there was this huge question of how would Elena come back and how would she be a part of the ending if Bonnie doesn't die? Well, according to the show, the answer is really simple. Bonnie just breaks Elena's sleeping curse. That's it. I'm not kidding. She just undoes it just like that. We don't even know how she does it. When Elena asks her how she did it, Bonnie just says, It took some time, but I think I finally figured this witch thing out. <laughs> <laughs> what? Really? Really, Julie? Is this the level of effort we're putting in the final episode? This is how you're wrapping up your eight year long story? I would just like to point out that at the end of season six, Kai makes it explicitly clear that the only way the curse can be broken is if Bonnie dies. That's it. That's the only way. Bonnie has to die to break the curse. And Kai also says that if Bonnie tries anything to break the curse in any other way, she will die instantly and Elena will never wake up. That was the thing. Those were the established implications of the sleeping curse. Yet somehow, Bonnie just breaks it 
out of nowhere. There's no scene leading up to her figuring out a loophole or creating a spell or whatever, nothing. The show is doing something completely different with other characters and out of nowhere, we just cut to Bonnie waking Elena up. It's never explained. This is the level of laziness we're dealing with in season eight and it renders the story completely irrelevant. And that's mainly because the writers were not really concerned with actually wrapping up the story of the show. They were more interested in wrapping up the various ships and romantic plot lines that were plaguing the show, which... Oh, yeah, I should probably talk about that. You probably noticed that for a show that has so much romance in it, I haven't really been talking about the ships all that much throughout this video. I know some of you are gonna be bothered by that, so I'm gonna get it out of the way now. I don't care about ships. I do not fucking care about them. If you do, it's fine, that's cool, I don't have anything against it, but I don't. I think more often than not, excessive shipping driven by the writers tends to make shows actually worse, especially especially when the ships start to become a bigger focus than the actual story. Pretty Little Liars is a great example of that, and The Vampire Diaries is also one of the biggest offenders. I'm all for a good romance, but I said it before, the romantic storylines in The Vampire Diaries are just not that good. They never were, and after a while they just start taking away from most of the more interesting aspects of the show. And I know some of you are gonna bug me about it, so you wanna know my opinions on the ships in The Vampire Diaries? Okay, here they are, rapid fire. Elena and Stefan are fine in season one. After that, they're boring and obnoxious and I don't care. Damon and Elena falling in love never made any sense to me. It does not fit their characters in the slightest and you can't change my mind. Caroline and Tyler. Who cares? Bonnie and Jeremy were a sad excuse for a romance that never should have happened. Bonnie and Enzo were fine. Enzo as a character had no right to be in this show for as long as he was, but at least his romance with Bonnie gave him a reason to exist in the story. It was just ruined by the fact that the writers categorically refused to let Bonnie be happy. So here's a question. Do you actually care about Caroline and Klaus or do you just think they look hot together? I'm sorry, but it is way out of character for Caroline Forbes to fall for someone like Klaus. I don't care what you say, these two do not make sense. Jeremy and Anna can die in a hole. Caroline and Matt were actually cute before she became a vampire. Matt and Rebecca didn't make sense and I don't want to hear it. Alaric and Caroline are the creepiest pairing I've ever seen. I don't know what the writers were thinking. He was literally her teacher. Any romance involving Vicky was immediate ass. I would like to say that Catherine's fucked up romance with both Stefan and Damon was the most interesting one in the show. But unfortunately, the writers kept retconning it with the consent compulsion aspect going back and forth every other week and they mess with its continuity so much that their story doesn't actually make sense after a while so whatever and to finish caroline and stefan were fine they didn't bother me so all of you who are about to yell at me because you think caroline and stefan are wrong because you wanted stefan to end up with elena and not damon i don't care I could not care less. They're fine. They're overdone and way too cheesy, but they're fine. Leave me alone. I'm sure there are other romantic storylines I'm forgetting, but that's because they just weren't worth mentioning, I guess. Most of those romantic plot lines are dead ends anyway. They're only here to waste time or to attempt to create a new endgame ship the writers can bait fans with to keep them watching. But yeah, Helena finally wakes up about 10 minutes before the end of the show, and the story wraps up in a way that feels rushed and weirdly unsatisfying. Most of the characters get their resolution through very lazy narration in an eight minute montage that feels like an ad for Viagra. Everybody gets a happy ending. Every vampire in the main cast is now mortal, except for Caroline. Everyone is happy. There are no real consequences. Sure, Stefan dies, but like I already said, death is meaningless in the Vampire Diaries. I can't be in invested in a character dying when I've already watched him die over 40 times over the course of the show. And I sure as hell cannot buy into this death causing sorrow when this show has introduced 6 or 7 versions of an afterlife the living characters can access like it's a restaurant. His death means nothing and the end of the story is pointless. Anyways, yeah, this is how the Vampire Diaries end with a big... 
meh. All things considered, this isn't the worst finale of all time. It's bad, but it's not like insulting. It's not Pretty Little Liars finale bad, but for a show that went on for so long and with such a gigantic mythology, you would think they would have done a better job at wrapping it all up with a bow. It didn't need to be perfect, but geez, it could have been so much better than this. And now you're gonna ask, oh, okay, Dylan, then how would you have ended the show? And okay, okay, that's fair. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you how I would have handled the Vampire Diaries as a show if I had been in Julie Plex's place. And no, I'm not gonna use my cheat code of making the show more mature and by making it darker, I'm only gonna stick to basic writing. Ready? Okay, here we go. Number one, the show should have only had four seasons. And number two, Catherine should have been the final villain. And yes, I know, technically, Catherine is the final villain of the show, but I really want to emphasize on the technically. She only appears in the very last episode. She has about seven minutes of screen time during which she does absolutely nothing, and then she just dies. She didn't have an arc. She didn't have a true resolution. She was just a last minute bait and switch because the writers had Nina Dobrev back for one episode, and they thought it would be cool if they brought Catherine back so they just made some shit up on the spot without any real point to it they spent the whole season fighting Arcadius only to kill him off like three episodes before the end which is really awkward by the way and then out of nowhere the writers are like psych Catherine it was Catherine and it's completely stupid no 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 when I say Catherine should have been the final villain I mean the final season should have been hers she should have been here the entire time. First of all, ending the story with Catherine as the final boss of the show is the best way to make it all come full circle. Not only is Catherine the first true nemesis of the series, she's also the villain who has the biggest emotional connection to the character. She pretty much started the chain of events that led to everything in the show even happening. She's the one that led everybody down the path of madness that was the entire show. Season 8's idea of having Catherine attempt to unleash Hellfire on Mystic falls to destroy it could work. The way they go about it in the show makes no sense, but it could work. In my version, Elena would turn into a vampire at the end of season 3, just like in the original show, but she would turn with Catherine's blood in her system. We would essentially find out that Catherine orchestrated for Elena to turn into a vampire. And once Elena's transition is done in the first episode of season 4, Catherine will kill Jeremy to overwhelm Elena with grief and force her to turn off her humanity switch, which she does. So basically, the final season would have everyone going against Catherine and Elena together. Boom! Now every character has emotional stakes for the final season. Elena fights Caroline, she fights Bonnie, she fights Stefan, she fights Damon, maybe she even kills Alaric. Alaric can go, I don't care. And for Catherine, that is the perfect way to torture the Salvatore brothers and keep everybody occupied while she gathers everything she needs to open a gate to hell to blast Mystic Falls with Hellfire. But then, Elena, with the power of love, is brought back by Stefan, and the whole gang bends together again to take down Catherine once and for all in an epic final battle. And eventually, Damon, who spent over a hundred years trying to save Catherine, sacrifices himself to kill her, as he holds her to allow Bonnie to redirect the Hellfire and blast them with it as a final blow. Catherine is killed by her own plan blowing up in her face, Damon is redeemed in his death, and Mystic Falls is saved. Then you can have a sappy ending where the remaining characters grieve all of their losses but get a happily ever after as one big family and... I don't know, maybe Bonnie becomes Queen of England. Honestly, she deserves it. Give this woman a throne. But yeah, that's what I would have done with the Vampire Diaries. I don't know, maybe it's not perfect, but you know what? It's much better than whatever the fuck Julie Plegg and her writers ended up doing. <laughs> Okay.
okay. Breaking down the characters of this show is a real fucking hassle because there is just too many of them. And to be completely honest, none of them are that interesting, except maybe for one or two. A lot of the characters in this show are very bland. As long as they look good on screen, Julie doesn't seem to care all that much. Like, why make Tyler interesting if you can just have him be shirtless, am I right? And yeah, that's Julie's biggest priority with the show. Being sexy. Even when it comes to the actors, it's a pretty well-known fact that aside from a couple of people, the acting of the Vampire Diaries is pretty bad. Sometimes it's so bad that it actually takes you out of the show. It's really distracting. So when you combine bad acting with even worse character writing, you get yourself a recipe that can be very painful to watch. Because yeah, the character writing is pretty mediocre, but we'll talk about that in a minute. For now, let's break down the characters of the show, or at least those I think are worth talking about. Let's do this. Elena Gilbert. Oh boy, we're starting there, huh? <laughs> Ugh, fine. I hate Elena Gilbert. She's the fucking worst. Now hear me out, okay? Just hear me out. I'll be fair, all right? I'll be fair. At first, in the very beginning of the show, Elena is fine. She's underwhelming, yes, but I think she's supposed to be. I'm inclined to say it was intentional. When you meet her, she's very depressed and detached from everything. She's still very much grieving her parents, and she's not used to being around people anymore. Throughout season one, characters keep alluding to the fact that Elena used to be more fun, that she used to be the life of the party, but that she hasn't been the same since her parents died. So it makes sense to me that she doesn't start off immediately as the most compelling main character in the galaxy. It makes sense for her character, and you know what? You'll believe it. You'll buy into the sad girl persona. You'll buy the quiet emo girl in Converse shoes who writes in a journal. You'll buy it, because it's a good setup for that character. It's a good point of initial characterization. However, the issue is... Elena never changes. Throughout the entirety of this show, Elena has literally zero character development. She's essentially the same character from season one all the way to season six when she leaves. Nothing about her changes or evolves. Elena just eternally remains the bland main character with absolutely no personality and it's not helped by the fact that the writers never know what to do with her her, aside from making her an eternal martyr, people constantly need to come and help. Elena is probably the biggest damsel in distress in the history of television. It is absolutely appalling how much this character constantly needs to be saved. I swear to God, every episode of The Vampire Diaries in early seasons essentially boils down to Elena needing to be rescued. It's insane distracting in season one alone. One episode she gets kidnapped and she needs to be saved. The next episode she gets into a car crash and she needs to be saved. The very next episode she's being stalked by an evil vampire and everyone needs to bend together to find a way to save her. And by the end of the next episode she is kidnapped again and she needs to be saved again. Almost every cliffhanger at the end of the episode is essentially the same thing. Something bad happens to Elena and the next episode will consist of people having to bend over backwards to rescue her ass. And it is only made worse by the fact that Elena is an insufferable crybaby and her personality is so bland. She is such a boring character and she is so annoying. She's always complaining, like me right now. What she wants always has to come first and she consistently lets everyone put their lives on the line for her, mostly because she bites off more than she can chew and finds herself in dangerous situations because she thinks she can handle things that more often than not, she ends up not being able to handle, which she should have known because people warn her about it beforehand. And she's always sad and crying and complaining. Even in the comic books, all she does is complain and people have to tell her to lighten the fuck up. And while she already gets annoying very fast in season one, it's really in season two that she kicks it into full gear. Elena makes things so needlessly complicated for everybody. She is constantly making demands to everyone. And the part 
that annoys me the most is that everybody bends to her will. Always. All the time. When Elena wants something, everyone in this fucking town just execute themselves to do whatever it is that she wants, even if it makes things worse. The amount of times the team had a plan to fix an issue and it went south because Elena just had to throw herself in the middle of it because of her bullshit sense of self-importance makes my blood boil. It's always the same fucking thing. They have a plan that works and then Elena decides she doesn't want to stick to the plan and it results in things going to shit because she fucks everything up and now everybody has to abandon the plan to go save her. Whoa, what are you doing? I'm going with you guys. No, 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 no. No way. You need me. You get yourself killed. You're not going in there. I'm going. Elena, you can you can drive the getaway car. Hmm? You're not going in the house. You can't stop me. Oh yeah, by the way, even after this scene, she ends up not listening and sneaks in anyway after what she immediately needs to be rescued by Damon. She is a constant liability, and I'm sorry to say it, but she's just so stupid i mean it elena is so dumb you don't believe me okay okay let me let me let me let me, let me just show you let me just show you how stupid she is Bruh. bitch are you serious the door was right there right there rose can't go out in the sun. She's a vampire. Going outside was literally the safest and quickest thing you could do. She is forced to stay in the house. Why would you go upstairs? Oh, and if that's not enough, she does the exact same thing literally two episodes later. And it's not only that. Sometimes, Elena will willingly throw herself in the middle of the danger just because she doesn't want to be kept out of the loop. She will completely throw a winning strategy to save the world out the window because she's too nosy. And even when she gets what she wants, she is so useless that she just slows people down or becomes a direct element that can make the plan fail. And I gotta say, Elena was already the most insufferable character to most people when I was watching the show week to week back in the day. But when you are binging the show, it is a thousand times worse because it's so obvious. You realize that every time a problem arrives in these people's lives, it is systematically made worse by Elena. Usually, when a problem arises in the show, it's easily solvable, sort of. Not always, but in a lot of instances, it is easily solvable. But every time a problem is easily solvable, Elena just has to get in the middle of it and throw a tantrum and make it complicated. And the thing that makes her even worse is that her being this annoying is clearly unintentional. A few people heard me say in another video that I find Elena annoying, and their comeback to me was to say, well, Caroline is also obnoxious and annoying, especially in the first two seasons. And yes, you're right, but Caroline is designed to be obnoxious and annoying. That's the point of her character. She's obnoxious and loud and clearly overcompensating for her insecurities and everyone can see through it. It's on purpose. This is how the writers intend for you to perceive Caroline. But in the case of Elena, it is clearly not on purpose. The writers want you to perceive Elena as fundamental good, as like this pure soul who always wants what's best. These flaws are not intentional. Elena is just one of the most insufferable TV characters of all time. I cannot stand this character. And yes, that's for all the reasons I just stated, but also because of the fact that Elena is a character that never changes. No matter what happens to her, she'll be affected in the moment and then will revert back to being the exact same boring ass character she always was. She is not allowed to have any kind of character development. She's a terrible protagonist and it's really annoying. I cannot stand the self-centered damsel in distress she is. 
Elena Gilbert is one of my least favorite characters of all time. I'm so fucking done with her. I never want to see her again. Let's talk about bootleg Edward Cullen now. Stefan Salvatore. Okay, so to be completely honest, I'm not too sure what the general consensus is on Stefan. I feel like he's a character that tends to divide fans. Some people really like him and they think he's a cool dude and others absolutely hate him and say he's the worst. But I feel like the one common opinion people have of Stefan is that he's boring. And yes, even the people who like him say that. I guess people see Stefan as the Superman of this show, or the Captain America, the fundamentally good hero with stand-up values that can come across as boring because they never really do anything that's unexpected. Stefan doesn't drink human blood, he survives on animal blood, I see a lot of people say he's lame because he's a vampire that doesn't kill people, you get the gist. People think Stefan is boring because he's too much of a goody two-shoes, but weirdly enough, Enough. I kind of disagree with that. Even in season one, Stefan has always had a bit of an edge. Yes, he's a good guy and his character is often presented as the superhero of Mystic Falls, but I think a lot of people forget that Stefan has proven several times from season one that if you put him in a position where you're impossible to reason with, he will kill you. He won't think about it twice. He won't hesitate. He might not enjoy doing it, but make no mistake, Stefan will fucking kill you. Vicky was this innocent girl who was turned into a vampire by Damon against her will. Stefan tried to help her, but the second her thirst went out of control and he couldn't contain it, Stefan killed Vicky on the spot. He didn't even think about it twice. Later in season one, a vampire tricked Jeremy into letting him into the house and he started stalking Elena. Eventually, Damon and Stefan get their hands on the guy and they interrogate him to know his intentions. And as soon as the interrogation is over, even though the guy was at their mercy, Stefan killed him in cold blood without an ounce of remorse. And still in season one, when a couple of the tomb vampires attack Stefan and Damon in their home, Damon tries to be defensive to get info, but Stefan doesn't waste a single effort and immediately murders one of them. But also, season one has a closing storyline where Stefan becomes addicted to human blood again. It's short-lived, but sort of compelling. The whole thing is a very obvious allegory for real drug addiction or alcoholism. It's not very subtle at all, actually, but some of the scenes actually work as this metaphor. Stefan is on edge, he has withdrawals, he lies to the people he loves, he hides things, when he gets caught, he tries to gaslight the people that caught him. I don't know, it worked for me. My head is pounding. I feel like my my skin is on is on fire. I have this hunger inside of me that I've never I've never felt. In my opinion, the problem with Stefan isn't necessarily that he's boring. The problem is that the writers are too hellbent on the notion that Stefan has to be tied to a romantic plotline. And it just doesn't work for his character. Every good storyline involving Stefan has been a storyline about him on his own. Season three proves that. The reason why people love Stefan so much in season 3 is because it's the first time he's given a storyline that doesn't involve him being obsessed with Elena. It's his first storyline that is about him, and people realized, oh yeah, Stefan can actually be super interesting. He has a fascinating past. Finding out that Stefan used to be a legendary vampire known as the Ripper back in the 1920s was fucking amazing, and watching him become the Ripper again when Klaus forces him to shut his humanity off is just as thrilling. Ray, you can end this right now. Just tell me where your pack got it for the full moon. Stefan was just leaving after failing to make his point. And Paul Wesley is so much better at playing that than he is the disingenuous heartthrob the writers desperately want Stefan to be. Anyways, Stefan is fine. He's not a great character, but I also wouldn't say he's a terrible one. I do think he's a slightly better character than people give him credit for, but that said, he 
does get incredibly pointless after season three. As soon as Julie Plegg decides she prefers Damon and Elena together, Stefan becomes a narrative afterthought. It's not that he isn't a part of the story anymore, because he is, but he's just kind of there. He doesn't contribute all that much. He's mostly here to look concerned about things and to spit out the most generic hero lines ever. Then he falls in love with Caroline and they get married and much like they did with Elena, every single part of Stefan's personality becomes a vehicle to be obsessed with his love interest. Overall, Stefan is a painfully average character and quite the definition of wasted potential. They could have done so much more with him and the fact that the writers somehow completely missed the gold mine of great storylines they had with him is baffling to me. The end of his character also feels really empty. Like I said earlier, the problem with the Vampire Diaries is that death means absolutely nothing. It didn't do anything for me to watch Stefan die for the 87th time. It just doesn't have any emotional weight. They're like, it's for good this time. Okay, sure. But 10 minutes later, we see him in the afterlife, which is virtually the same as most deaths in the show. It's pointless, it's hollow, it's cheap, I hate it. What a wasted character. Ugh, all right, let's talk about Blue Eyes White Dragon now. Damon Salvatore. Okay, I have been waiting to talk about this guy because I have some shit to say, especially after rewatching the show. I think it's a pretty common opinion that Damon is easily the best part of the Vampire Diaries. He's hands down the character people enjoy watching the most, and it's easy to understand why. Damon is an incredibly entertaining character, and he's played by Ian Somerhalder, who is probably probably one of the most effortlessly charismatic people to ever live. He gives such a strong personality to Damon that it's almost impossible to not be thoroughly entertained by him when he's on the screen. It's just so fun to watch Damon being so detached from life. I know it sounds grim, but it's true. This guy doesn't give a flying fuck about anyone. Everyone is disposable to him, innocent or otherwise. You married? No. Parents, children, anyone else who lives on this property. No, it's no. me. Good. Fire. For the first few seasons, it's very compelling to watch him walk on that very fine line between good and evil. In season one, he actually has a really solid semi-redemption arc. The way he joins the good guy's crew over time is really interesting, his motivations make sense, and his slow turn is really emotionally charged. Damon is the only character on the show who truly seems to have themes attached to his storyline. Whether it's love, grief, the fear of being alone, the fear of feeling guilty. I mean, yeah, Yes, you see that in other characters to some degree, like Klaus, who is doing all the evil shit he's doing because, yes, he wants power, but also because he's afraid to be alone. He doesn't want to be the only hybrid. That's scary to him to be alone in the world. Sorry. Can't let you do that. I'm sorry, but there's nothing you can do to stop me. Yeah! Fired. But with all that said, I have to say something. I have a hot take, and I know a lot of you guys will be mad at me, but I'll say it. I actually don't think Damon is that good of a character. Now hold on, hold on. That doesn't mean I dislike him, because I don't. But as I rewatched the show, I came to realize that Damon is not all that amazing on a writing standpoint. There are issues with the way he's written, and I'm not saying that lightly. I think Damon is one of the few characters I can think of that suffers from being too charismatic for his own good. The reason I say that is, yes, Ian Somerhalder is an insane insanely good looking and charismatic guy and he's a decent actor. But I think that after season one, the writers rely on that charisma way too much to make the character work. Unlike Elena or Stefan to some extent, Damon does evolve as a character. He gets a whole lot of development. The issue though is that the second the writers don't really know what to do with him, they take away all of his development to reset his persona for a new growth journey. And once you realize that, it completely changes the landscape of his character and it makes him kind of frustrating. One of the reasons why they do that is, well, one, a lack of creativity, but also because Julie Plague noticed that fans loved it when Damon was evil, and that creates a weird inconsistency in the way she writes him. In other words, she tries to have it both ways. On the one hand, she wants Damon to be this fun, psychotic killer who enjoys being bad to the bone, and she makes him do 
do all these irredeemable things. He kills people, he tortures them, he abuses women, sometimes underaged women, he drinks too much, he torments his brother. He's so irredeemably evil that it's impossible not to see him as a villain. But on the other side, Julie also wants Damon to be a hero. She wants him to be the good guy whose heart is completely consumed by love and the power of his love for Elena compels him to do good and he saves the day and he's reliable and Julie expects you to see Damon as a great hero just because he's in love with Elena now and just because he has a few romantic sequences with her where he's all vulnerable and shows the heart behind the bad boy and just based on that you're expected to forget that he was abusing a 17 year old girl for fun a week before when you really take a look at it there's actually very little to defend about Damon maybe until the very end of the show where he literally saves the world but Bro, the way audiences came to his defense like he is some misunderstood anti-hero instead of the murderous psycho he was baffles me. Y'all are ready to forgive a whole lot of shit if the person is good looking enough. And I'm not the only one thinking this, by the way. Ian Somerhalder himself has been very open about the fact that he does not understand why people defend Damon so much. He doesn't get why people always try to justify his actions and the fact that leaning into his horrifying darkness made audiences love him more caused the writers to rinse and repeat a lot of his storyline which made Ian extremely frustrated the writers seemed to really lean into the audience's vision of Damon being a martyr and as a result Ian Somerhalder did not like the direction Damon was going he's been very clear that it made him really unhappy this show and this character were an enormous psychological experiment. Damon could literally walk into an orphanage and kill like 20 kids in cold blood. And literally the audience would say, oh, you know, he had a fight with Elena. He was in a bad mood. There was no bourbon. I mean, they would make excuses for this man. I'm by the way, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Julie and Kevin had to beat it into my head. Now this is so many years ago, so it doesn't matter. It's like, it's not like, you know, gossip, but I was so upset <laughs> about, about the trajectory of Damon. So much so that at one point I was sitting across from Julie in her office in Atlanta, almost in tears, so angry about this. And she said, dude, I get it. Kevin had to say this too. Damon cannot be a one trick pony. And I get what they're trying to say, but I gotta agree with Ian's frustration here. Damon is a one trick pony and he's a one trick pony because the writers rely on Ian's charisma way too much. His storylines from season one work by going in circles. It's always the same cycle. Damon is evil. He's doing bad things. He's killing people and he enjoys it. Eventually his feelings for somebody close to him get him to snap out of his violent outbreaks. He struggles for a bit and becomes a bit more gray. Then something bad really happens, another villain shows up and Damon decides to team up with the heroes to defeat a common enemy. He sees the value in the people in his life during the fight and he becomes a good guy and finds a bit of happiness. But then something will happen that will set him off, something is going to be taken from him, someone is going to hurt his feelings and as a result he acts impulsively and kills someone again. Then he realizes he likes being bad and he struggles to put himself back on the right track until he eventually goes off the edge and becomes a murderous maniac again. So now Damon is evil again, he's doing bad things, he's killing people and he enjoys it. But eventually his feelings for somebody close to him get him to snap out of his violent outbreaks, he struggles for a little bit and becomes a bit more grey. And something bad really happens, another villain shows up and Damon decides to team up with the hero to defeat a common enemy. He sees the value in the people in his life during the fight and he becomes a good guy and finds a bit of happiness and rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And the problem isn't that this arc is not interesting. It is for a while. Like I said, in the first couple seasons, watching Damon as he tries to navigate the thin line between good and evil is truly compelling. And Ian Somerhalder sells the shit out of it because he is really good in 
in this role. But repeating this cycle for eight seasons is completely insane. And I'm sorry, but yes, it does make him a one-trick pony. There's a reason why people love Damon's storyline with Bonnie so much in season six. That's because it's the only time in the entire show that he gets to do something different. And it's also the only time his character is allowed to exist outside of Elena. And Ian Somerhalder himself said it was a blessing to get that storyline to change things up. But the end of five, sure. um, you know, was kind of exciting because there was just, we didn't, we hadn't had that sort of level of a cliffhanger or something like that for Damon, Stefan, or Elena. And it was also pushing us out of, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Jules, but like pushing us out of that narrative that, you know, you would typically see Damon, Stefan, and Elena together, you know, clumped into this tight little group. It was really, Damon had found this other really special relationship and Kat, and Kat Graham and I really cherished that because we got to work together and really break down some really sort of granular, awesome stuff. And that storyline revealed a lot about Damon's capacity to care for people, which is some credit that a lot of people don't give him. A lot of people say that Damon only stops being heartless when something is related to Elena, but that's not necessarily true. And it's also not just a season six thing. In season two, Damon has a very beautiful scene where Rose, his friend and ambiguous lover, slowly dies after having been bitten by a werewolf. Rose has been in excruciating pain for days, slowly agonizing as the bite kills her, so when Damon senses she only has a few minutes left to live, he uses his powers to give her a final dream where she is human again and able to enjoy the sun back in the 1500s when she was growing up. He joins her in the dream and then he just sits down with her and they just enjoy the sun together. And he didn't do it with any ulterior motives, he didn't do it to torment her in a fucked up way by showing her what her life could have been, he wasn't trying to play some anger. No, he did it simply because he wanted Rose's final moments to be bright and devoid of any pain. He just wanted his friend to be at peace. I'd like to enjoy the fresh air. Will you enjoy it with me? For a while. Then yeah, in season 6, he develops this insanely precious and intimate friendship with Bonnie. And later on, the show truly dives in his relationship with his brother. So overall, Damon is probably the most complex character in the entire show, but it's often undermined by the writers locking him up in a never-ending cycle of repetition with his storylines. Because they just like it when Damon is being charismatic and snapping people's necks. And yes, again, it is fun to watch Damon being completely detached from life and doing horrible things things with the smile on his face, but after a while, it takes so much away from his growth as a character that you constantly feel like he's regressing every time he becomes evil again. And that's a huge disservice to his character. So yeah, Damon, long story short, love him for the charisma and the performances, not so much for his story throughout the show. He'll always be entertaining to watch, and that's all thanks to Ian Somerhalder, but I can't help but feel like there was some really good stuff left on the table in favor of cheap plot lines for him. Eh, it is what it is. Alright, let's get heavy. Bonnie Bennett. Okay, this... This is personal. I think everyone who has watched The Vampire Diaries knows Bonnie is a very particular case that needs to be talked about. That said though, before we jump into the nitty gritty of it all, because a lot of it has to do with Cat Graham, Julie Pleck, and the behind the scenes of the show, I first want to talk about Bonnie as a functional character in the context of the story. And to start it off, I'm just gonna say it bluntly. Bonnie Bennett is probably one of the most disrespected characters I have ever seen on television. It's kind of shocking. I know I'm not really teaching anyone anything with this, but it's still worth pointing out because upon rewatching the show in the last few months, I have been left in a state of complete disbelief with almost everything regarding her character. 
Let me explain. So Bonnie is a witch. She's the main witch of the show and she has some fairly strong qualities. She's independent and ambitious and she's very protective over the people she loves. She's also very powerful as a witch and sometimes, especially towards the end of the show, it's kind of alluded to that Bonnie might be the most powerful witch in the world. And that's about all I can tell you about her because in the 171 episodes of this show in which she plays a key part of the plot, the story never cares enough to tell you anything more about her and it cares even less about showing you anything more about her. The whole lore around her witchcraft is the most poorly constructed mythos in the entire show. None of it makes sense. Her powers are incredibly inconsistent. Sometimes she can do very tame things that don't really have an impact on stuff, and other times her powers are so incredibly strong that she almost qualifies as a god. In season 1 and 2, Bonnie is essentially capable of killing a vampire just by staring at them. She doesn't even need a spell, she can just give them aneurysms and she makes it very clear that she could just kill them if she does it for long enough. She also has the ability to turn water into fire, so if she has water around her, she can spontaneously set any vampire on fire like it's nothing. The problem with that is that it makes Bonnie way too overpowered and she can pretty much end every storyline in a matter of seconds. There's plenty of times where that power could have come in handy, but she just kind of never does it. The reality of it is, Bonnie's powers are not real lore, they're a plot device. Her powers are nothing more than a way for the writers to write themselves out of every plot hole or narrative corner they back themselves into. That's it. The writers will write an insane storyline and then they don't really know how to resolve it, so they make Bonnie do some magic and everything is fixed and you're just supposed to accept it because Bonnie does magic, that's what she does. They never really explain how she comes to do the things she does. Literally, at the end of season 2, Jeremy gets shot and he dies. He's super dead, he just dies. And then Bonnie just brings him back to life. It's never explained how she did it, and it's never explained why she doesn't do it again. We just know she needed help from her ancestors, but she still just kinda does it, and then the show moves on. I also really dislike the whole Bonnie has to face Klaus and die mini storyline in season 2. That was incredibly dumb. Bonnie essentially makes herself die, and then she comes back to life, and it's never explained how she actually did that. Like, she was dead. We saw her die. How did she resurrect herself while being dead? No joke. Literally, the only explanation we get for how she did it was Damon saying she cast a spell. She cast a spell. Bonnie's okay. That's it. That's the extent of it. She cast a spell that effectively makes Bonnie an immortal, untouchable god. Her character is never in any real danger. And that's the big issue. That's the only utility her character has. She's just a device for the writers to work out loose ends in the plot. Bonnie is clearly the last thought on the writer's mind. And she's also the last priority in their list of character building. They clearly don't give a shit about her. Let me give you a few examples of what I mean. Bonnie is the only main character in the show who does not have a set for her home. We only get to see her home around season 3 or 4 and aside from her grandmother that dies in the very beginning of the show, we don't get to meet Bonnie's family until like season 3. And it's not because they're not around or something like that. From episode 1, we know Bonnie lives with her father. While we meet every parent of every character from the get-go, Bonnie is the only one whose parents we never really get to see. Her father is mentioned dozens of times throughout the show, but we only get to meet him in season four. He appears for a couple of episodes, and the only reason why he does is because he gets brutally murdered in front of Bonnie in the first episode of season five. And then that's kind of it. They only introduced him as a full-fledged character because they were planning on killing him off. We also briefly get to meet her mother, Abby, who is a witch turned vampire 
there, but she never gets an actual storyline like all of the parents. She's just kind of there a couple times and she never matters. So much so that people forgot she actually exists. I'm pretty sure most of the people watching this video right now who watch The Vampire Diaries completely forgot about Bonnie's mom. She pops up in a total of seven episodes in all eight of the seasons with about 15 minutes of screen time in a show that is almost 200 hours long. Even Matt's mom, who never has any direct link to the story, gets to stay around more than Bonnie's family, who are all directly related to the mythology of the show. And that's not the only thing. Even if Vampire Diaries is a show that leans heavily on romance, Bonnie is the only main character who doesn't get to have a primary love interest, even if every character has one. Elena has Stefan, and then Damon, Caroline has Matt, and then Tyler, and then Stefan, and Bonnie gets a dead-end romance with Jeremy, and a bunch of non-characters who never really stay around. Usually, if a character is introduced as a potential love interest for Bonnie, chances are the writers are either setting Bonnie up to be betrayed and have that character turn out to be a villain, or they're just planning to kill off that character in an episode or two. And yes, usually these characters are black. In fact, the only two characters Bonnie ends up having lasting romantic relationships with are the only two that are white, aka Jeremy and Enzo. Enzo is the only true romantic storyline she gets to have, and that's in season 7, roughly 140 episodes into the story. And again, Enzo is unceremoniously killed off the following season, and she ends the show alone. Because, yeah, the writers kind of have a thing with Bonnie's life being as tragic as possible. They really enjoy making her suffer. Most of the characters in the show suffer, to be fair, but generally, they get an equal amount of happiness and a sizable amount of rewards for their suffering. Except for Bonnie. Is this last one gonna be a little heavier for her? I can't imagine that in the final season, they would decide to go easy on her. That would be incredibly um, against uh, all characteristics. She's a character that only exists to come to assistance to the people the writers consider to be more important. She's the one who has to make sacrifices for others that always end up leaving her alone, and more often than not, the writers never allow Bonnie to have a storyline to let her deal with tragedy. For example, Elena's brother Jeremy dies, and she gets a full storyline where the consequences of the event affect her. Caroline watches her father die, and after that happens, she gets a whole storyline that shows the repercussions of that tragedy on her character. Same goes for her mom, who dies later in the show. Bonnie also watches her father get brutally murdered by Silas right in front of her, and then the show just kind of moves on. We don't have time for Bonnie, we gotta move on. But the writers are also completely unaware of what they make Bonnie do and how wrong it is, and that's where we get into the topic of race with this show. What do you th what do you want to happen? What do you think? Elena's everything gone. has happened. Yeah, everything that could possibly happen except positive representation for Bonnie has happened. Oh, oh yeah, my yeah. God. That's the, that's the my girl Bonnie, thing. man. They did yeah. her dirty hard. So hard. So, so hard, hard, Jesus bro. Christ, man. That character is What better. a wasted yeah, character. So, such a Holy waste. Moly. The writers of the Vampire Diaries have a huge boner for the Confederacy. They love it. They think it's great. There's a lot of it in the show, and they glorify it a bit too much, if you ask me, but that's not the point. Damon was a Confederate soldier before he became a vampire. There's a bunch of scenes talking about the Confederacy, and there's this incredibly stupid scene where the school reenacts a history moment of Confederate soldiers in Mystic Fall during a whole ass parade, and Bonnie, the only black person in the crowd, is cheering along with the a big smile. She's like, woo, white supremacy state built on slavery. Yeehaw. It's just appalling to see how devalued Bonnie is as a character. Everything about the way she's written is so regressive. I hate it. They failed that character so bad. Julie Plegg is so oblivious to the way she handles characters of color. And it's not surprising when you see the way she seems to perceive race in general. She's had a long reputation of being racist and being an A-grade example of white feminism. And one incident in particular really seemed to confirm that to people. 
people. If you don't know the story, let me give you a little context. In July of 2020, the popular rapper Megan Thee Stallion was shot in the foot by her then boyfriend. There was a whole thing around it. The media was covering it everywhere. It was a big deal. As a result of the whole ordeal, Megan Thee Stallion went on Twitter to express her frustration. She said the following. Black women are so unprotected and we hold so many things in to protect the feelings of others without considering our own. It might be funny to y'all on the internet and just another messy topic for you to talk about, but this is my real life and I'm real life hurt and traumatized. The tweet obviously garnered a lot of attention and Megan received a lot of support online. And then Julie Plek decided to swoop in and drop one of the most uncomfortable replies I've ever fucking seen. I believe black women are going to save us all. And I am so sorry to put that pressure on you, but white women are continually failing all of us. I hope you understand that me seeing you as a hero is not meant to add to your anxiety. Rather, it's to lift you up and celebrate you. You didn't say that. Tell me you did not just say that. Oh my god. <laughs> Julie, Julie, do you need a Kit Kat? Do you need some coffee? To be fair, she was immediately called out by a black writer who flat out laid a truth bomb on her way of thinking and how it made Bonnie the most devalued character on TVD. And Julie took down the tweet and apologized, but oh boy, this lack of self-awareness did not fly. And I get it. Khadija made a whole video about it and she breaks it down really well. I highly recommend you watch it. I'll link it in the description down below, but it is absolutely insane. So yeah, Julie's perception of race is very much in tune with the way characters of color are treated in her shows. And not just the characters, the actors too. And this is where we have to separate Bonnie Bennett from the actress who plays her, Cat Graham. I think it's no secret that Cat Graham did not have the best of times being in The Vampire Diaries. It was pretty rough. While Bonnie on her own is a black character that is clearly written by white writers with very rocky values when it comes to race, Kat, as an actress, had to face a lot of racism behind the scenes. Whether it was from fans, from in-house people, even from co-stars. Matt Davis, in particular, made a very inappropriate comment about Kat's Jewish background. We're gonna talk about him later. But she's even faced this in more minor ways. Famously, the writers weren't on board with the idea of Bonnie entering a romantic relationship with Damon in season 6. And instead, they pushed for what a lot of people perceived as a forced friendship. It's often speculated that the writers thought Bonnie Bonnie, as a black character, was not good enough to be in a big ship with one of the two main boys. But everybody wanted it though, and Kat was very open about the fact that she thought that dynamic could be interesting, both for her character and for Damon. She said it several times in interviews, but it's funny to look at how the writers constantly try to talk over her and shut her down every time that idea is brought on the table. Really cool, and then we have a Teen Choice nom, so it's, it's really nice that people are um, appreciating um, the work that Ian and I do together and, and are, are seeing that and recognizing that it really means a lot. Is that something that you would ever consider doing? The thing, it's so, their friendship on the show is so powerful. It's just so fun. She, I don't know, I'm feeling like Damon is still madly in love with Elena. Bonnie's gonna maybe have her own love interest this year and it's not gonna be Damon, so... Kat had very little power over anything regarding her character, which in a way can make sense, right? She's not a writer on the show, she's an actress. Her job is to bring to life what the writers wrote. But it is kind of sad to see how unwilling the people behind the show were to allow Bonnie to leave the very white Hollywood mold of characters. She couldn't even get her hairstyle to fit her more. Her hairstyle! Kat once tried to ask the producers of the show if Bonnie could use her natural hair in an upcoming season. You know, just to be more in tune with the realistic appearance of a black woman. And she was shut down immediately. It's been really therapeutic for me to just wear my hair really, really big. The African Afro texture is not something that Hollywood has ever necessarily embraced. So I hope that I one day can play a character that I actually look like. For info, throughout the entirety of the show, Kat exclusively wore wigs as Bonnie, and the people behind the show were apparently completely opposed to the idea of her using her natural hair in any capacity. That's by far the 
dumbest thing I've ever heard. And that's what's so regrettable about it. It's not only Bonnie that was treated like lesser than as a character. Kat was also treated like lesser than as an actor. She was not given the same level of care or attention or consideration like any of the other leads. She was treated like a disposable object. In fact, Julie Plec allegedly wanted to fire Cat Graham and kill Bonnie off during the production of season 8. But, allegedly, Ian Summerhalder did not tolerate it. He apparently stepped in and told Julie he would flat out leave the show if Cat was fired. So Julie changed her mind and Cat got to stay. It took for the most bankable actor on the show to come to her rescue for her to be treated with a minimum of decency. And you know what? That's too bad. Rewatching the show, I realized that Cat is probably the best actress out of the entire main cast. She is by far the most consistent with her performances. And along with Ian Summerhalder as Damon and Joseph Morgan as Klaus, she manages to elevate the incredibly shitty material that is given to her on a regular basis. To the point where, in emotional scenes, she outshines every other character in the show easily. Like, they could have done so much with this character. I'm personally of the opinion that Bonnie should have become the main character after Elena's departure at the end of season 6. It was the most logical move. Elena goes sleeping beauty and can only wake up when Bonnie dies, so Bonnie's life becomes the vehicle to carry the story on. It's like a passing of the torch type thing. It would have been amazing. It's just, ugh, the amount of wasted potential with this character fucking breaks my heart. She deserves so much better than this. But this potential, sadly, will never be achieved. Cat Graham has been explicitly clear on several occasions that she will never go back to the Vampire Diaries universe. She will never play Bonnie Bennett again. She is done. I'm pretty sure Julie Plec has been on record very recently saying they have asked Cat to come back as Bonnie several times in the last few years, either for cameos in other shows or to get her own spin-off, but Cat has turned them down every single time without hesitation. And honestly, I get it. Live your best life, bestie. Work on other projects, Queen Slay. No, but for real, I'm glad she stood her ground and refused to come back. Good for her. I hope she thrives in this industry. She honestly deserves it. <sighs> what a bummer. Okay, let's move on. Caroline Forbes. Okay, perfect character to lighten up the mood a little. Caroline is easily one of the best characters in the show, and one of my favorite, which is saying something coming from me, because I find her kind of insufferable in season one. I mean, yes, she's designed to be annoying, but still. You do feel bad for her throughout the season because of the blatant physical and mental abuse she's subjected to by Damon. It's actually worse than I remembered it being, but aside from that, Caroline's presence in the show in season one is largely meant to make her as obnoxious as humanly possible and it works. She is incredibly obnoxious. Thankfully though, I think Caroline as a character is at her worst at the beginning of the show. But she actually gets pretty cool as the story goes on. In my humble opinion, turning Caroline into a vampire at the start of season 2 was probably the best choice that could have been made for her character. The hardships that come with it, especially when it comes to her relationship with her mother, who has devoted her life to exterminating vampires from Mystic Falls, are super compelling. But even beyond that, Caroline just becomes a fucking badass. I can take you. Want to bet? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Told ya. Damn, Caroline. Okay. Okay, I see you. She's the only vampire whose life truly seems to have gotten better from being a vampire over time. She comes into her own way more, she learns to know her worth, she really figures herself out, and you essentially watch her becoming stronger and stronger and more confident as an individual. And she really becomes the most likable character out of the entire main cast, I think. Caroline never really matters in the story, if I'm being completely honest, she's just kind of there the whole time. But I'm not complaining, because I genuinely enjoy Enjoy her presence in the show. Candace King is really fun as Caroline. She makes this character so endearing and cute that I can forgive the weak storyline she's given throughout the show. The whole series of episodes where her father learns she's a vampire and kidnaps her to torture her in an effort to change her nature was a little awkward. It's a not so subtle allegory for gay conversion therapy, which is very clumsy on the writer's part because they also decided to make Caroline's father gay, which... 
good job, Julie. Later on, Caroline is magically impregnated with Alaric's children. It's also really awkward because then Alaric and Caroline become sort of romantically involved, sort of, and they get engaged and it's weird. I hate it. I don't know. In the later seasons of the show, Caroline is not given the best writing, but Candace manages to upkeep the likability of the character. So even if she doesn't really do that much, she remains a very welcome presence. Overall, Caroline is not the most impactful character on The Vampire Diaries, aside from a couple romantic storylines she gets, but I genuinely think the show would be way worse if she wasn't in it. I believe she shows up in one of the spin-offs, if not both, she may be in one scene in Legacies, and she seems to be really adored by the fans, so hey, more power to her. Not much else to say, honestly. I love Caroline Forbes, and I'm happy she exists in this show, so yeah. Next, Tyler Lockwood. He's boring, he's useless, I don't like him or any of the werewolves for that matter, let's move on. Alaric Saltzman. This case is interesting, because from what I understand, it seems like a lot of the Vampire Diaries fandom absolutely despise despise Alaric Saltzman, but it doesn't actually have anything to do with the character himself. In fact, I'd say that in the first three to four seasons, Alaric is a pretty cool character. He arrives in the show about halfway through season one and he's charismatic, he's like a cool guy. He's a brand new vampire hunter who's trying to figure out who killed his wife and he eventually finds out that Damon did it, but also he turned his wife into a vampire in the process. He eventually joins the main team he becomes a parental figure to Elena and mostly Jeremy and he's like the reliable cool uncle friend who helps you fight evil things. I don't know. He gets some really questionable storylines in the later seasons like pretty much everybody else. But overall Alaric is perfectly fine as a character. The way he's written is not the reason why people hate him. No, apparently Matthew Davis who plays Alaric is a bit of a creepy weirdo and I was not aware of that until until very recently. Aside from his weird comment about how he thought there was some serious sexual tension between Alaric and the very underage Elena, which bro, what the fuck? He allegedly had a habit of being really inappropriate on the set of the show. He also has a tendency to post really weird rants on Twitter, like all the time. He's apparently a very vocal Republican, a Trump supporter, and he goes as far as publicly going after his Vampire Diaries co-stars on Twitter over political shit. I believe he notably had a very public argument with Paul Wesley during the 2020 elections. I'm pretty sure Jenny Nicholson also mentioned him talking talking about having tons of guns and daring people to come to his house so he could shoot them. Okay, big guy. And if that's not enough, when he's not busy taking shots at Cat Graham for being half Jewish, our boy Matthew also has a history of inciting Asian hate online. He publicly blamed the COVID pandemic on Chinese people, just in general, Chinese people. <laughs> all 1.4 billion of them. And he even had a banner on Twitter that read the line, boycott China. So, um, yeah. Apparently all of that didn't bother Julie Plake or the CW enough though, because up until a couple months ago, he was still employed and making millions playing the role of Alaric Saltzman on Legacies. So I don't know if it's Matt or Julie or someone over at Warner Brothers, but somebody needs a Kit Kat because what the fuck is going on there? So anyways, um, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just gonna moonwalk myself out of this one because I don't want to talk about him anymore. There are a bunch of other characters in the show and they, for the most part, are really bad. And they're not worth talking about all that much. I know some of you are gonna bug me about it. I'm just gonna say it. I don't like Jeremy, okay? I don't know if that's an unpopular opinion or not, so you're free to yell at me in the comments if this is sacrilegious, but I don't like him and I don't care who knows it. He is such a boring character and it's not helped by the fact that the actor who plays him gives the most bland performance out of the entire main cast. I don't know what his name is, uh, sorry, but Jeremy appears in over a hundred episodes of this show and I don't think he manages to convey one single emotion the entire time. He takes so much space in this story and it gets really tiring to watch him deliver every single line of dialogue 
the exact same way. Jeremy Gilbert is very much one of the worst elements of the show. I never want to have to hear about him ever again. Matt Donovan is the same to me. He's all right in the first two-ish seasons, but there's no reason why this guy needed to be in every episode for all eight seasons. Same for Enzo. He appears later in the show, but I feel the exact same way. Like, we get it. He has a British accent. Sheriff Forbes, however, is actually really cool as a character. I liked her unlikely friendship with Damon, and I really enjoyed the difficult ups and downs of her relationship with her daughter, Caroline. She overstays her welcome a bit, and she doesn't have much to do after the first couple seasons, but it's fine. Most of the characters overstay their welcome, to be completely honest, because, again, Julie doesn't want to get rid of anyone, even if exiting a character makes more sense for their story. Or, when she does decide to kill off characters for good, it's the wrong ones. I personally think the only character that should have been resurrected in this entire show was Lexi, Stefan's best friend, who was absolutely amazing. But yeah, Julie doesn't have the guts to truly get rid of characters who are taking too much space. Usually, when a character dies for good or leaves the story, it's only because the actor playing the character asks to be written out. Nina Dobrev was not interested in renewing her contract after season 6, and she wanted to do other things with her career, so Elena was written off the show. Michael Trevino was bored with his character and felt like his storyline were too repetitive. He wanted out of the show, so Tyler was killed off. Claire Holt was tired of being in America and wanted to go home to Australia to spend time with her family, so she asked to be written out of the originals. And that's why Rebecca Michelson leaves about halfway through the spin-offs for a season. Essentially, it's too many characters with too little to do. Most of the characters on the show can't really justify their own existence in the story, but they just stay around. They literally had to write Jeremy out of the show in season 6 because they just didn't know what to do with him anymore. Because he hasn't had a point in the story since season 1. Anyways, you get the gist. I've talked about the characters enough. If anything, this show just proves that you can only go so far by trying to bank on the charisma of your actors to have likable characters. <laughs> So, yeah, that's pretty much everything for The Vampire Diaries. It's a lot to cover, but I'm glad I did it. I was wondering if rewatching the show would make me like it more or less, and I'm surprised to find out that rewatching it after all these years has not really changed my opinion on it, and that's pretty rare for me. I don't know what that says about the show, but it certainly deserves that credit, whatever it means. A lot of it doesn't hold up as iconic as it is in pop culture, I'm not really sure this show will age very well, so much of it already seems incredibly outdated, and the show ended only five years ago, so... We'll see how that goes. But to finish this video, a lot of you guys on Instagram have asked me to rank the seasons in terms of quality. You know, so I can essentially gauge which season is the best and which one is the worst. I think that's a really fun idea. So thank you to all of those who suggested that. That's really nice of you guys. And I'm gonna do it. So here's my ranking of every season of The Vampire Diaries from best to worst. At number one, we have... Season 3. No surprises here, I think most people will agree. Season 3 is easily the best season of the show. While it's flawed and full of inconsistencies and riddled with plot holes, I think this was the point where the show had really perfected its formula. The all-out war with the originals is insanely entertaining, the rivalry between the characters holds the most tension, the backstories we get to discover are for the most part incredibly good, it's the season where every single character is at their absolute best, and overall, it's just a blast. It's a tad too long, it starts to ruin the lore a little bit with sire lines and the sire bonds, but the bulk of the season is so fun that I'm willing to let it slide. Simply put, season 3 is The Vampire Diaries in its most accomplished form. At number 2, we have 
Season 2. Honestly, I almost considered putting Season 2 in the top spot over Season 3. These two seasons are very neck and neck for me. Season 3 ended up winning because the storyline of the originals is just way too good, especially when it comes to Klaus and Rebecca and their past with Stefan, but I do believe that Season 2 outdoes Season 3 in certain aspects. For starters, I think in terms of pacing, Season 2 is the most well-balanced season of the entire show. Season 1 has better pacing, but it drags more in certain points than season 2. Season 2 has a better ability to pick itself up. Despite some down moments, this season just flows effortlessly, and while it's still a bit too long in my opinion, I only felt the drag in rare moments, but the payoff of the season is really worth it. The entire build up to Klaus, leading to what I believe is the best finale in the whole show, is really cool, and this season also has my favorite episode, Masquerade. This is by far one of the most thrilling episodes of the Vampire Diaries. It is so fun to watch. The whole episode is about the gang trying to outsmart Catherine. It's a really well executed series of mental games and tricks, all leading up to Catherine fighting Stefan and Damon at the same time while locked in a room. We really get to see the characters put their best dynamics in front, and we also get to see why Catherine is so feared, both for her brutal physical strength, but also for her intelligence and her ability to think six moves ahead. It's the perfect representation of what the entirety of the show could have been like. I love this episode. So yeah, season two comes in second place. At number three, we have season one. Not much to say here, honestly. I pretty much covered all of it already. Season one is fairly solid. It has a lot of ups and downs narratively, but Damon works extremely well as an initial villain. The mythology of the show is not too crazy yet, so we're just focused on vampires and witches. The lead up to Catherine is awesome, but there are already too many characters, the Elena was adopted storyline is really lame, the tomb vampires really drag down the season, and the council is still the most eye-rolling antagonistic entity in the entire show. So yeah, season one, you round up the top three, but you're on thin ice, kiddo. At number four, we have... Season 6. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know this is gonna surprise some people. To be fair, from that point on, the ranking almost doesn't matter because the seasons are all pretty bad, but Season 6 kind of bounces back in more interesting ways than the other ones. I think it's the season that feels the most different out of the entire show, and it really plays both sides in terms of quality. The highs are really high, but the lows are really fucking low. The best part of the season is obviously the bond that Bonnie and Damon form while stuck on the the other side together. And that's the biggest strength of the season, honestly. It has this ability to use character dynamics in a way that feels so effective. The chemistry is at an all-time high here. I may think Kai is an overrated villain, but Chris Wood is incredible in the role and has amazing chemistry with Cat Graham and Ian Somerhalder. Their banter is so entertaining to watch, and overall, the whole dynamic within that storyline is some of the best stuff the show gave us since season 3. With all that said, though, by that time, the lore and overall story of the show have gotten so messy that it's not even fun to try and follow. The character writing is all over the place, there are too many villains and none of them really matter aside from Kai. In other words, everything regarding Bonnie and Damon on the other side is pretty solid, but everything else about this season is just atrocious. Season 6 is not unwatchable, but it's still very weak. At number 5, we have Season 4. Season 4 is really a annoying to me. I did not have fun re-watching it. It's not the worst thing in the world, but I think I particularly dislike it because it is such a sharp decline in quality from season 3. It's really jarring. Most of the characters actually don't have anything to do this season. They're just there, doing nothing. And it accumulates so many storylines I cannot stand. Elena turning her humanity switch off got real old real fast. Her sire bond to Damon is a story line I particularly despise. The Brotherhood of the Five is laughably bad, the originals are completely out of place in this season, and of course, season 4 has about half of its runtime devoted to building up Silas, and therefore destroying most of the mythology of the show. This season is so full of plot holes, it's actually impressive. At number 6, we have... 
Season 5. I stand by what I said earlier. Season 5 is by far the most forgettable season of the show. Not a single thing about it is memorable. You can skip it entirely and nothing changes. I wish I could comment on it more, but when I said earlier I just watched this season twice for the video and already forgot most of it, it wasn't a joke. There isn't anything to say about season 5, it's just empty. So yeah, let's move on. At number 7, we we have... Season 8. The final season of the show is obviously really bad. There are very few redeeming qualities about it. The series finale has a couple of good scenes, but they're still wrapped up in an extremely unsatisfying ending after an extremely unsatisfying final season. Everything about it is underwhelming. Rewatching this season made me want to go to sleep. And coming in dead last at number 8, we have Season 7. Season 7 is kind of embarrassing. Embarrassing. <laughs> I know this sounds mean, but dude, it's so bad. I swear, I had such a terrible time watching it, I considered quitting this video altogether. There are several points throughout this season where I seriously considered abandoning this video. The heretics, the Salvatore mom, the hunter girl person, oh my god. Even by Vampire Diary standards, a show that most people have accepted is kind of trash. This season season is particularly mediocre. It is by far the show at its most tired and needlessly contrived. And it just screams we should have ended this story years ago. It's awful. There's literally nothing about this season that is worth watching. Like, I think you can skip season 5 because it's just not that impactful. Nothing happens in it that is actually important to the story. But you should skip season 7 because it is garbage. It's so bad. It's terrible. I blame Julie Plague. Everything is her fault. Are you proud of yourself? So, in conclusion, The Vampire Diaries is a fucking mess. An iconic one, sure, but a mess nonetheless. Holy shit, that rhyme. I did not do that on purpose. In my opinion, this show is a perfect product of its time. It's a show that was meant to capitalize on the Twilight mania of the late 2000s. It did so better than any other TV series, and it really managed to have a long life, and it really established its presence in pop culture. I have no real idea of what the general consensus on this show is. I very much experienced it in a bubble, but clearly it has to be doing something right because while the originals is over and Legacies was cancelled, Julie Plek has confirmed she is currently working on a third spin-off in the universe, 13 years after the original series started airing. I don't think I will ever watch this show again. I have had my fair share and while in the end I would say this show is more bad than good. It does have memorable moments that are fun to experience. Yes, it's cheesy. Yes, it's overly convoluted for no reason. Yes, Julie Plek has proven to be a very dodgy showrunner throughout all three of these shows. But between the main cast and some of the moments in those first three seasons, I think The Vampire Diaries did enough good for people to hold on to for the foreseeable future. This show is not going anywhere. I'm done. Peace out. Somebody give Julie a Kit Kat and I still pray that Denis Villeneuve makes a big budget spin-off movie about Bonnie Bennett. Hi Friendly Space Ninja. Hi Friendly Space Ninja. Hi Friendly Space Ninja. My name is Ilana. Hi. Okay, Vampire Diaries. So, I watched Vampire Diaries for a better part of my uh, teenage years. It's one of those shows that uh, I love watching because I feel like nothing is expected of me. So at its core to me, The Vampire Diaries is an exercise in how can we put as many characters as possible in the most toxic relationships as possible. I like The Vampire Diaries because it's so incredibly messed up. Like the storyline doesn't make sense half the time. They make up people, they make up deaths that don't make sense, but then they try to explain it and it all just gets messier and messier every time they try. Character development is pretty much non-existent in my opinion, except for Elena. Um, and her character development is really bad. My next note is um, just Alaric, question mark, question mark, why, question mark, question mark, ew. I don't know how much I like the ending, but there was like a period of the show that I thought I had a lot more fun with than I did down the line. A big reason why certain characters are beloved by fans is because of the actor that portrays them. 
i.e. Damon Salvatore. Get Graham was done so dirty. Bonnie, her character, she deserved way better. I mean, they shouldn't have killed her off every fucking season. Vampire Diaries is absolute shambles, mate. What killed the show was Nina leaving, definitely. All of the other characters and all of the villains were just annoying. Season two, there's a bad guy and then, you know, they defeat the bad guy and then they need a bigger bad guy in season three and then they, they defeat that one and they need a, a bigger, bigger bad guy in season four and they just, it ends up not believable and repetitive and boring. What do I think about Vampire Diaries? I think it is simultaneously less and more problematic than Twilight while not being nearly as interesting as Twilight. I have a grievance against the entire character of Stefan. I don't know how the writers managed to do it, but they somehow made a 160-year-old serial killer vampire have the personality of a salt team cracker. The vampire diaries were cringe. Uh, that's all I can say without really angering people. I think what makes the vampire diaries as remembered as it is today is when it came out. It came out at a very specific point in time, you know, from like the song choices to the actors involved. You see, I didn't actually watch The Vampire Diaries while it was airing, despite every girl in high school telling me, oh my god, you gotta watch it, it's so good. I just, I never got around to doing it because I wasn't trying to be different. I just, I couldn't do it. It aired on a school night and I had homework to do. All of the stuff with the originals and if you kill an original, their whole line dies. That was all so annoying. I stopped after season two or three. Cause um, well, it was going way too far for me. <laughs> Elena gets really so much hate, and I know I'm probably gonna like get a lot of hate on this, but I actually think Elena is like a decent character. So I watched the pilot episode. I was like, damn, this show like actually kind of seems good. It's like a shitty romance, but okay. And I just ask, as an American, can writers of vampire drama set in America stop making their vampires confederates? Please and thank you. Okay, bye. Vampire Diaries is a shit show that should have just ended with season one and should have just never been picked up. <laughs> Thank you.